live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Knifeware Live on YouTube. Uh, I'm Nathan. Behind the camera is Sky. Today, we're going to be teaching you guys some advanced knife skills. Uh, we did a little poll on our Instagram, on our Discord, on uh, YouTube. Asked you guys what you want to learn. I've got a couple knife skills of my own I'm hoping to teach and share with you. Uh, the goal today, we're going to start off with maybe a little 15 minutes of knife skills basics. Uh, just like how to hold a kitchen knife, how to not cut your fingers off, that kind of thing. Uh, but, and then we're pretty steadily going to get into the advanced stuff. We'll probably talk about different sizes of cuts, why those are important, and mm, what you might use them for. But really the goal here is to teach you guys some stuff that's a little more difficult. Stuff that a lot of professionals probably know how to do already. Uh, or if you're new to the kitchen industry, um, stuff you want to learn. Uh, but for home cooks, stuff that like isn't necessarily common sense or might seem challenging or intimidating. And we're going to break it down, make it easier to do, um, show you some simple steps for improving your knife skills and for learning just more advanced techniques. And uh, hopefully you, means you can just have more fun in the kitchen enjoying your knives. Uh, today I was just telling my friends over on TikTok, a few knives I'm going to use today. Um, they're linked down in the description if you want to take a closer look at any of them. But this is my brand new ish Hado Sakai Bunka, the Sumi Bunka. Show that off of the B cam there. <clears throat> I bought this guy just two weeks ago when we did our last live stream. And it's pretty awesome. I've been using it for uh, two weeks now at home. And it started to get a bit of a patina. It's carbon steel, it's white carbon steel, and so it's starting to change color a little bit. We'll talk a little more about carbon steel today, if that's something you want to learn about. I've also got my Moritaka Ishime 240mm Gyuto. This guy is, this is my first ever Japanese kitchen knife, and it's still one of my favorites. I know in the comments, uh, we made a post on YouTube yesterday asking you guys for suggestions and stuff you wanted to see today. Grant uh, Hendrick, one of our regulars, asked to see a longer, slimmer knife in action. He asked about a Kiritsuke. I don't own one, so I'm going to use this guy instead. But this is a longer, slimmer chef's knife with a flatter belly. We've got my Haruki Shiso Penny Knife. Whoop, whoop. For uh, some of the smaller jobs, some of the in-hand kind of stuff. Sometimes I use this guy for uh, segmenting citrus and whatnot. And then, just for fun, Got this one uh, last year in 2022 when Masashi-san was in Calgary, Alberta. Uh, this is my Masashi Kokuin Kobunka. This guy's pretty beautiful. Uh, great little small prep knife. Oh, oh, that. Did I do it? Yeah. Woo! We're in focus. Yeah, so this guy's pretty awesome as well. Yeah, so I'm going to use a bunch of knives today. If there's a knife skill you want to learn, pop it in the comments. For those of you watching on TikTok, we're mostly paying attention to the YouTube comments, but I think Sky has TikTok open there too. So um, we'll do our best to get to all of your questions and get to them more or less in order. If you have a question about the specific thing I'm doing at the moment, though, definitely pop that in because we'll, we'll try to prioritize those ones a little bit. Uh, yeah, so thanks everybody for tuning in. Hope you're having a great Friday. And uh, let's get into it. Unless we got any other announcements, I, I don't think so. No, no announcements I can think of. We got a ton of people watching and saying awesome. hello. Hello, we everybody. We had a quick little blip with the audio, but I think that's just kind of down to the internet. So thanks, yep. everyone, for all your patience with that. Thanks, and, uh, internet. The, yeah, what's it got to be the way that it be? Yeah, all right. Um, yeah, awesome. Well, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And, yeah, let's get started. So <clears throat> the first thing we're going to talk about here, excuse my throat today. It's very dry in Calgary. Uh, and just been coughing up a storm all day, so uh, bear with me, I'll drink lots of water. First off, when you're using your kitchen knife, uh, you the way you hold it's going to go a long ways to, to um, how well you can cut. In fact, I'm, I'm going to rewind even a little bit. Um, so we're talking about advanced knife skills today. There's a few things that are essential to be able, being able to perform advanced knife skills, to being able to make cuts that are consistent, and in many cases small, or at least precise. Uh, and one of those things is a sharp knife. I'm going to be using Japanese knives today because we sell Japanese knives and we happen to love Japanese knives. Uh, your knife doesn't have to be Japanese to be good or to be sharp, uh, but it does need to be sharp to, to work well. Sharp knives are safer and, and more importantly for today, they're more precise, right? They go exactly where you point them. Uh, so you're not fighting, you're just getting the cleanest cuts possible. Um, that's something I learned very quickly working in restaurants and something uh, where a lot of people would struggle if they didn't take good care of their knives. Uh, struggle to get good cuts and to get a nice presentation. 
uh, if their knives weren't sharp. So make sure your knife is nice and sharp and, uh, and just take good care of it, right? I like Japanese knives because the steel is, generally speaking, harder than a lot of the other stuff out there, and so they hold their edge longer, uh, and that's what I really like about them. As far as controlling the knife goes, we're going to hold our knife in what we call a pinch grip, and if you've watched our videos before, you have seen this a million times. The idea is you're pinching the blade just in front of the handle between your thumb and forefinger. Now, a lot of us learn to use kitchen knives or taught ourselves to use kitchen knives by holding the handle, right? It's called a handle. Why would you hold it? Well, it's a little different from other tools like a, a hammer or a screwdriver. <coughs> the handle is there, <coughs> excuse me, to sort of balance out the knife and to fill into your hand. But if you're holding it back here, it gives you less control over the blade and you have, grab some other cut here, you have to press harder to get the same amount of force through what you're cutting. Whereas if you move up the blade a little bit and grip it like so, right? Just gently between thumb and forefinger. You don't need a death grip on it and you don't need to be holding it all the way in the middle of the blade. Just right in front of the handle there. It's just gonna give you more control because you're applying pressure closer to where the edge is. And so I, I don't really remember a lot of physics, but basically <laughs> it applies the force better. Makes the knife cut good. Uh, and so that's, for me, step one, is, is hold your knife in a way that's going to allow you to control it. If that freaks you out, you know, if you're a little bit knife averse, you can sneak your hand back a bit, but just try not to hold it at the very end of the handle, right? The knife is going to be safer and less likely to cut you if you're gripping it closer to the blade. Now, this hand is the one that's really going to get cut, right? Uh, the left hand or the opposite hand is the one that you need to be worried about. And when I see a lot of folks cutting, um, especially if they haven't had any formal training or taken a knife skills class, I often see their fingertips kind of out so that they can guide the food towards the knife. But if your fingertip is sticking out under the, uh, under the edge, that's when you're likely to get cut and, and to really harm yourself. And so what I do instead is I curl those fingertips under so they're nowhere near the edge, and I put my knuckle out like that. There we go. Perfect. And basically, I have either the knuckle of my index finger or my middle finger sitting out front. And then I put the side of the blade against that knuckle. There we go. And so, when I'm cutting, the side of that knife is gliding along. There we go. It's gliding along that knuckle. Now, if you're used to cutting in this like paper cutter motion where you always leave the tip of the knife on the cutting board and you press down through the food, that's risky. You can shave off your knuckle doing that and you're more likely to cut yourself. So when you have a sharp knife, sometimes it takes a little retraining. And, and what I like to do instead is pick the knife just up so the edge is more or less parallel with the board. Pick it up over the food and then just slide it forward. And I'm, I like to slide my knife forward most of the time. You can slide back if that's more comfortable to you. But Working in a sliding motion, letting the edge do most of the work for you, is really what's going to allow the knife to work better. I uh, hope that makes sense so far. If, if you have any clarifications, let me know. But once you get into that, that habit of sliding the knife, riding it against your knuckle, that's when you can start to use that knuckle to guide the knife and do finer cuts, right? Because you can control the thickness of what you're cutting. And then you get into that smooth motion and it just becomes second nature after a while. I'm a little rusty, but that's, that's what's going to allow you to control the knife better and, and to get better cuts. Because for me, there's two big things that dictate how I cut, uh, how I cut uh, a vegetable when I'm cooking it. And that's size and that's consistency. You want to think about the size of what you're cutting based on... Uh, how long you're going to be cooking it and what method you're using. So for example, taking this carrot again, if we're making a stew, we are going to break this carrot down into like a large dice, right? Big piece like that. You can square it off, um, but I don't, I don't care too much about having perfectly square things. I prefer just to not waste anything. So for me, that's like a large dice of carrot, and that's going to stay together longer in something like a stew, but it's also going to be easily broken down with a spoon. If you put that size of carrot in a soup, it might cook through, but you're going to end up with a 
a big chunk of caramel in your spoon and nothing else. So you'll, you also want to think about how you're going to eat it. Uh, for comparison's sake, we'll break this carrot down a little further. If I was making a soup, it's not cooking as long as a stew. So I'm going to break my carrot down into a couple sheets there. And then I'm going to cut it into kind of like a long baton like this. You know, like a carrot stick. And then I'm going to cut those down into squares. And that's kind of more of a medium dice. Right? And so that, compared to this, that's going to cook sl slowly, right? And it's going to stay together better. This is going to cook faster, but if you're having a stew, you can kind of mush it up and just get a little bit of carrot on your spoon. And so even though your piece is this big, it's going to, uh, it's going to break down easily. And so you, it's not going to overwhelm. You're not going to get just a bite of carrot. Whereas if you're making, you know, eating soup, if you have a bunch of little pieces that are kind of like this medium dice size, you're going to be able to get a few of those on your spoon and you're going to have a little bit of carrot, a little bit of potato, and a little bit of you know, beef or, or chicken or whatever else is in your soup. So cooking time the, and how you're going to eat the food uh, is really what matters most. And then just consistency, right? Because if you have a big piece of carrot and a little piece of carrot and they go in the same pot at the same time, one of them is going to be mush and one of them is going to be hard uh, at the end of the cooking time. And so you want to cut things in a roughly similar size so that they uh, cook at the same rate, right? Um, and then when we're talking about how we're going to eat things, you know, if you have a spoon, like I said, you want a few little pieces on that spoon, so a nice sm small or medium dice is generally good for that. Uh, if you are going to eat things with chopsticks, though, you might want them shaped a little bit differently. Uh, I find with chopsticks it's easier to grasp something that's a bit longer, so maybe we'll do like a, a julienne or, uh, or something like that. So for comparison's sake, take our carrot again, and we're going to do what's called a bias cut. So we're going to run our carrot straight across the cutting board like so. We're going to angle the knife at about 45 degrees, and we're just going to take some nice slices like so. Again, sliding the knife, starting at the tip, and gradually sliding towards the back. And then we're going to stack up a few little pieces of carrot. So, in, so I, I find that like three or four pieces in a stack works pretty well. And then we're just going to cut straight across. And we're going to use this finger, the, the knuckle of the left hand, to kind of guide the thickness of our cut. And we're just going to slowly slide that back so that we get the size of cut we want. And so for my stir fry, We've got these nice julienne, which are going to cook quickly in a pan. Because we're doing stir fry, we're only spending five minutes in the wok. And it's going to be easy to pick these up with chopsticks. And you can get a little piece of carrot, a little piece of green onion, and a little piece of whatever else is in your stir fry. So those are kind of like the basics. If you're, if you're, we, we had a few people asking about that, like how do you know what size to cut the thing or, or, or what shape to cut it. And, and really that's what's going to inform that decision is how long is it going to cook for, how are you going to eat it. And, uh, and then just making sure you have consistent sizes. Got a questions. Awesome. Question away. All right. So we have one question uh, asking what are all the ways to cut an onion and shallot, which I believe we're doing late. We got two onions. Later. So two I can onions. show you three ways to cut an onion. Sweet. And then, we'll yeah, we got shallot. Next. Um, Nicholas was asking, how do you hold the knife if it doesn't have a bolster? If it doesn't have a bolster, right. So some knives. I don't even know. Oh, we got one here. <coughs> like this Masakage Zero it has a bolster right there. It's, it's sort of like a smooth transition point from the handle down to the blade. And that can create a more ergonomic kind of transition from that handle to that blade. A lot of traditional Japanese knives have more of this like hard edge. I mean, it's, it's not an actual hard edge. It's rounded out. But this kind of sudden drop from the handle to the blade. I don't mind that, I'm pretty used to it now, but it does just take a little use to get used to. Some, some uh, European knives have like a thick bolster behind the blade, like back here. Um, I know my old Henkel's does. I'm not a fan of that, uh, it really complicates the sharpening, but if you're used to that, it kind of feels like a safety guard. So something that doesn't have one can feel kind of dangerous. But same way, regardless of the knife, I just gently pinch in front of the handle there, between my thumb and my forefinger. 
My middle finger here rides up against what's called the choil. That's this part of the knife right in behind the blade right under the handle. And my middle finger sits right there. And so my middle finger kind of drives the knife forward ever so slightly. And so I, I think more of the motion, that kind of sliding motion when I'm chopping comes from that middle finger than it does from the index finger or thumb. I hope that makes sense. If you have a, a clarification, let me know. On the topic, yeah. Uh, Landwater said, might want to remind folks that the claw grip is mostly for t knives that are tall and have enough height in the blade mm. to glide along your knuckle. What about a petty? Petty knife. <laughs> a little bit lower. Whoop, whoop. Oh, oh, there we go. Petty knife. Yeah, um, I, I still use the claw, but I'm pretty careful and I've also maybe got more experience than the average person. Uh, if I was cutting with a petty knife, I will generally have, I'll, I'll still pinch up or, or choke up on the knife there. Um, I like a 135 petty because it's big enough that it doesn't get lost when you do that. But I do, I still kind of buffer up against my knuckle and it, I haven't cut my knuckle off yet doing that. Um, but you can just scoot your hand back a bit. You still, I still like the claw just for safety's sake, but I find this, this guy has just enough knuckle clearance that I can kind of chop down with it. I actually use this petty knife for quite a lot of cooking. And so if you're looking to control the thickness and consistency of your cuts, the petty knife probably isn't the one to do that with um, because you, you just can't buffer against your knuckle that well. I pull this knife out when I just don't care and I'm just like throwing together a quick meal, you know, a quick salad or a, or a, a stew or something. I just need to chop up a couple of veggies. Uh, Trevor wants to know. Yeah. Are you pro or anti carrot peeling? Smiley face. <laughs> um, well, you can tell probably that I haven't peeled any of these carrots because I'm I didn't want to. I'm lazy. Um, I am anti carrot peeling. I guess if I had to take a stance. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't know carrots were so bipartisan. But um, yeah, I. Here's the thing. In the summer, I grow my own carrots in my vegetable garden. And you don't have to peel them. You just wash the dirt off and then they're delicious. And nowadays I don't peel carrots because uh, I feel like I'm throwing money in the garbage when I peel <laughs> carrots. And because uh, groceries are really friggin' expensive and that sucks. So. True. Yeah. Um, we have a comment on TikTok. Uh, <laughs> how much to carrots. shave the stash? How much to shave the stash? Uh, <laughs> I feel like five grand. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds reasonable. I'm pretty cheap. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I would. Um, yeah, I mean, I got some summer projects I want to do. I need to insulate my basement, so yeah, I feel like five grand would cover that. There you More, go. I mean, I'd take a million dollars. I really, Gillette offered ZZ Top a million dollars to shave their beards, but... Um, we just have to get you to the, like, ZZ Top, ZZ level, top of level of influencer. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, they were known for their, for their Instagram account. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Jeff was saying he's surprised we're using a Bunka and not a Nakiri in this demo with veggies. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I love Nakiris. They're great. Um, I just have a brand new Bunka, so I'm using my brand new Bunka a lot. And it's sick. Yeah, it's a sick knife. Super cool. <laughs> Look at that thing. It's awesome. <laughs> um, I do use Nakiri a lot. I, I don't actually have a regular Nakiri. I only have a Mega Nakiri from Moritaka. Um, it's a long story, but I gave away my, my Koishi Nakiri. Uh, I am due to get another one, but uh, yeah, it's a great knife. I'm just not in the habit of using it right now. Cool. Well, let's... <clears throat> Let's move on to a few different cuts now. Um, okay. So we talked about different cut, a few different cut sizes. I hope that helps. So this is basically a large dice. That's kind of a medium dice. We'll get into some smaller dice uh, and brunoise later, like a fine dice. Um, but I like to show those off because often, if you haven't had culinary training, um, a lot of people don't quite realize what those sizes actually mean, and they can be pretty vague. And so I like to give that as, as an example. That's a, a Julien there. But we did have somebody on YouTube um, asking on our post how to increase speed. And so I'll maybe talk about that next. I'll grab some, some celery here. Because at the end of the day, if you're not getting paid to cut, speed isn't that important. Um, now, obviously, there's other stuff that goes on in life, right? We only have so much time in the day. But if you're worried about nice presentation, I would focus more on precision, speed will come with time, right? The only way to get fast is to practice. Otherwise, you'll be fast and bad as opposed to fast and good. Uh, I used to play guitar, and if I tried to rush, I just played softly, and the same goes for nice skills. However, um, a few tips for getting fast besides just doing it more. 
let's see. I'm, I'm going to have to do this as I talk through it. So we've got our claw grip, got our knife, pinch grip. So really getting the motion right is important for speed. And here's what I mean by that. If you just, I'll just do one piece here. If you just chop really fast like that, right? Now I've done this a lot, so these cuts are pretty consistent. But look, because I'm not using an Akiri with a flat edge, I've got this piece that's all still stuck together, right? And so if you're worried about going faster, either you're gonna want a knife with a flat edge that's gonna make those really clean cuts like an Akiri, or you're going to need to learn to move the knife more effectively. So in, in addition to just sliding forward, I'm also rocking slightly. I'm not rocking like, you know, like the 90s TV chefs like this, but I am going tip first and then following through. Tip first, follow through, right? And the trick is to get the motion down, get your cuts consistent, get in the habit of moving this left hand backwards slowly as you cut, and then just slowly pick up the pace. And, uh, and as far as like moving the tempo up, it's almost like a metronome. Like you just kind of have to, have to slowly increase that speed. You could even like listen to music at different tempos if that, if that, I find that can help me sometimes, but it really is just getting that motion, get consistent before you get fast, and then just slowly increase your speed. And eventually you don't even have to look at what you're doing and uh, you can cut blind without cutting yourself. Cool. That's it. I mean, it, it really is just practice. I was slow and terrible at first, um, but you, you know, you cut enough 50 pound cases of vegetables in a restaurant and you get fast. Um, if you're looking to increase your speed at home as a, as a home cook, um, cook bigger meals, right? Cook, prep, prep food for the whole week and do all your chopping in one go. Um, because you will just, you'll just get into the habit more. Uh, practice like anything is just going to make you better, but doing a lot of practice all at once will really help you, help you nail that. Um, and, and really pay attention to that left hand. It, it takes time learning that inching back motion. That's one of the keys to speed for me. And, and basically the way it works is as I cut, I make a cut and I just slowly drag that index finger back. And then once my index finger gets too far back, I move my whole hand back. And so it's kind of like, I don't know, it's like an inchworm, sort of. I'm trying to show that in slow-mo. It's probably not very clear, but I hope that helps a little bit. If there's a specific uh, task that you are having trouble being fast at, let me know. And, uh, and I can get into that specifically. We don't throw away our veggies, we use them. We'll have some nice mirepoix for a sauce or bolognese or something later. Um, Tyler L. wants to know what your thoughts are on 90s TV super cook Chef Tony. Tony. Do you know a Chef Tony? Chef Tony. No. Sorry, uh, we're too cool for that. I don't know, man. Uh, I did watch a lot of, like, food TV as a kid. Um, but it was mostly Emerald. I loved Emerald and Jamie Oliver. And uh, Japanese Iron Chef. That's the way. I feel like I'm forgetting someone obvious. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna do, show you how to do one more cut, two more cuts, and then we'll get into question and answer time. So, another thing somebody asked about was super thin slices. I'm gonna show you with this carrot. Maybe we'll show you some other stuff later on. But as I was, as I've been kind of beating on a dead horse about uh, the trick to getting a precision cut is to use that index finger or that middle finger as a guide, right? Buffer the knife up against that. The other thing is just to, just to look at what you're doing, right? There's nothing wrong with hanging your head over so that you can see the knife and then just see how much vegetable is peeking out on the other side of that knife, right? If you want a super thin cut, you want to get as little vegetable on the other side of the knife as possible. Imagine the thinnest possible slice and try to make that slice. So I've got like half a millimeter there. And you're gonna mess lots of them up. You're gonna have lots of cuts that are like a little half disc. The trick is to steer the knife straight down as opposed to wiggling from one side to the other. But the trick is also to slide, right? So those are, those are fairly thin cuts. 
Not bad. But if you force the knife down, or if your knife's dull, remember you have to have a sharp knife, but if you force the knife straight down, you're going to have a lot less control. Whereas if you start with a tip and slide forward, you're going to have a much easier time gliding through and getting a clean, thin cut. Um, I hope that helps. I used carrot for an example. If the person that asked that question is watching, um, yeah, pop, pop a, a, a further question in the comments to see if there's something specific you want to cut. And then Julienne, Julienne is this like, matchstick that I showed you guys later. This is another one of those cuts that people tend to do too big. If you're on a proper Julienne, you want it to be pretty small because you want it to be either be pleasant to eat raw or you want to be able to throw it in a stir fry or something and have it done in like a minute or two. So for a julienne, uh, if I'm doing, let's do a potato now. So if I'm doing a julienne, uh, the first step, you've got to cut thin sheets and then you've got to cut, the, cut those sheets into sticks. So if you have a vegetable that's all roly-poly like a potato, uh, you want to start by cutting just a tiny little flat section on that potato, right? If you work in a restaurant, you would throw that piece of potato into the stock or, well, in this case, mashed potatoes, but save that, cut it up, eat it later. Next, we are going, and yes, for whoever asked about peeling the carrots, I am also anti-peeling potatoes. I think that's a sin. I trim them, but I don't peel them. Um, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to start with the tip of the knife and slowly slide through, following through with the belly of the blade. This is a great cut for an Akiris. Um, if, you, if you don't feel confident doing that, you can always start with the tip of the knife on the cutting board and drag it back. And I've, I see some people doing this. In my opinion, that's a recipe for cutting your knuckle off, but it is a very good alternative way to be precise. So we're going to cut some thin sheets about maybe two millimeters thick or so. Once you get to the end of the potato and it's wobbling and you're going to like slip and cut your finger, just set that off to the side. We can cut that later. Your finger is worth more than the end of that potato. Then we're going to stack up, we're going to make two little stacks. You don't want to make a giant pile because it's not going to be easy to work with. So we're going to make two little stacks of, of potato slices. And then we're just going to cut across, again, following through at the belly of the blade. If you have a Nakiri knife, you can just slide forward. But I'm going to rock just a little bit. And there we go. Then you have, then you have a nice looking julienne. Right, and you can make yourself some little matchstick fries. Uh, I'm sure you could do other stuff with this. I don't really know what right now. <laughs> Eat them raw. Um, Chinese bread. Well, so that's the other thing is those first few slides I did, I actually realized I was cutting them way too thin. So with practice, that's what you can do where you can you get this like stained glass effect where you can see through the vegetable that you cut. And that's pretty fun. This I like to do if I'm making like a potato pavé or like a, a dauphinoise where you're laying the, it's basically like fancy scalloped potatoes, you know, few layers of super thin potato, uh, cheese, cream, butter, other good stuff, another super thin layer of potato, cheese, cream, butter, and so on and so on and so forth, and then you bake it. It's really delicious. But you could, I know Colin, who you mentioned the Chinese potato thread salad. Mm -hmm. I've never had it, but I really want to try it. It's, it's, it's just really like really finely blanched potatoes, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, when Colin comes in for that cleaver skills video, we're doing a Chinese cleaver skills video in uh, in a month here, but you can cut some nice potato threads like that. I would do this and I would make a potato roasty where you you dip these in a little water, get the excess starch off, and then you dry it and then you toss in a bunch of melted butter and then you get your cast iron pan nice and hot and you throw a big pile of potato shreds in the cast iron pan you let it bake for a while, and you flip it, and you let it bake for a while. You just have, like, a crispy, potato-y friggin' deliciousness. Cool. So that is Super Thin Slices and Julienne Covered. Hope that helps for the folks that were asking about that. Thanks for everybody that suggested stuff for this video, and uh, let's move on to question and answer time. All right. Um... Earlier, Nicholas asked, uh, I know this ain't a question about cutting, but the red knife on your right, I think he meant the Silverthorn boning knife. How do you hold that? The Silverthorn boning knife? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it sure. depends on what you're doing. Um, who is that, Nicholas? Yep. Okay, so I'm just gonna clean up here. Here's another good thing to making like precise cuts and just being 
good in the kitchen, clean as you go, and especially keep your cutting board tidy. I like to have a workflow where my raw ingredients are on my on my right, uh, or sorry, on my left, so I can grab them with my left hand. Raw or prep stuff, cut stuff goes on the left in a little container. Um, we kind of got stuff scattered all around today, but that's you know, do as I say, not as I do. That's my suggestion. <laughs> uh, when it comes to how to use this boning knife, it depends on what you're doing. So, if you're trimming, um, say you have a tenderloin and you want to trim off the silver skin, I'm going to kind of hold it straight out like this, like you're. Give me your money, that kind of grip. Because um, <laughs> then you're getting under and you're kind of pulling this way. Um, if I'm deboning, if I'm taking a part of chicken, um, I like the finger on the spine. You can kind of guide the sweeping cuts. It's all about precision. You're trying not to leave meat behind. And so I like the finger on the top kind of method to like kind of wiggle the knife around uh, all the bones and stuff. And then if you're boning out like a pork shoulder or something, um, Say you got like a bone in pork loin and you're trying to take the, the pork rib bones out, you're going to do what's called the pistol grip, um, which is weird. It's more like the, you know, like the, what's the movie with the shower? Stephen King? My brain is saying The Shining, but it's definitely not, not the, shining. the Shining. Yeah, let us know in the comments. Psycho. That movie. Psycho. psycho, thank you. Yeah, so like people call this the pistol grip. It's kind of a psycho, the psycho grip, but where you've got the uh, boning knife like this, because when you're working straight down like this, it's really nice to get in around like the, um, the shoulder bone of a, of a pig, for example, or along uh, the spinal column and the rib bones. And so those are, those are like the three main grips that I like to do. I'm not a professional butcher, but um, I've done some butchering and that's, that's kind of how I hold my knife. Cool. This, this guy also, because you've got no safety guard on there, um, some people will throw like a heavy duty elastic band around there or even a bit of like hockey tape might, would probably be a good solution um, or just be careful because you can slip and, and cut yourself. So I would, Normally, I like to hold my knife by the blade. I think if I was using this guy, I'd, I'd scooch that hand up a little bit so I'm not injuring myself. All right, folks, you heard it here first. The give me your money grip. The give me your money grip. <laughs> um, all right, Craig is asking, uh, I've heard some people say that technique is more important for food release than the knife itself. Do you have an opinion on this? And if so, any tips? Yes. Both. Both are important. Technique um, for food release... I haven't found like the perfect way to to get food to, to pop off the blade. You'll pro you probably noticed me earlier struggling with like some of the bigger stuff was piling up the knife. Um, so that's one of the reasons, without even realizing it, I, I tend to prefer longer knives like a 210 or especially a 240 Guto because I can have my hand like half a foot away from the vegetable I'm cutting. And so even if stuff piles up, it's not really happening, but if stuff did pile up, it wouldn't get in the way of my driving hand. Um, but inevitably, some stuff will, like when you get like stacking cucumbers off the knife. Um, if you have a good way to get stuff to release off the blade, let me know. I haven't figured it out, if I'm being dead honest. But I do find that sliding the knife into the food helps when I when I whack up and down. Like, let's try this cucumber here. Cucumber is the worst one, I think, for, for not releasing because it's so wet. When you, when you do the up and down, the whack chop, yeah, you get stuff like sticking to the blade like that. Right? And I find, I think when I slide, it works better. Yeah, see, stuff's coming off a lot better there because I'm sliding the knife. But I know you, you may not think that the knife has to do with how the food releases. But in the case of this Hado knife, these guys are sharpened. Now, if you're a fan of the YouTube channel and you've watched Naoto's four-dimensional sharpening video, he does this thing, and a lot of newer Japanese knife sharpeners are doing this thing where the tip of the knife is sharpened really thin, and it gets just slightly thicker as you head down to the back of the knife. And, and that happens because it's got a taper. It's thicker at the, at the heel and thinner at the tip. It's a really great design. But what that means is when you cut tip first and follow through with the heel as is intended um, for many of these knives. The knife starts on that skinny part of the blade or the food starts on the skinny part of the blade and as it moves back, it splits off. And so it's actually designed to pop food off the blade um, without you really even noticing it. So that style of knife, like knives from uh, Hado Sakai, Masashi-san, there's a few others, but I can't think of them. Um, they are designed to, to work that way. And if you're into sharpening, you can sharpen your knife to, to do that. Hope that helps. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, last question before we can move on. Okay. Uh, Grant asked, I know Nathan keeping the handle off the board, uh, and he assumed to have more knuckle clearance. Mm. But I think you were just cutting a little bit closer to your body, maybe. With which knife? Uh, your Hado. With this guy? Yep. Handle off the board. Yeah, I mean, it I... It might have been the petty when we were talking yeah, about Yeah, it might have been with the petty. Um, I do cut kind of like tip down a bit, so I angled my petty knife down towards the cutting board a bit. Like so. Um, but I also like, you know, I, I do run my knuckles into the board, and it's not that big a deal. That's kind of why I like the petty, is because the, the tip of the knife can be on the board, but my knuckles are still off the board. Um, but if, if that is a problem for you, like definitely get a Kobunka. Even something like this guy is good. Um, but yeah, I do tend to angle my knuckles up away from the, from the board a little bit. Man, this thing is so thin, it's crazy. Talking about a knife for thin cuts, this uh, this Masashi Kokuin, it's just like bananas. Okay, so we're going to move on to doing a Brunoise of Shallot. So Brunoise is like a really, really tiny dice. Uh, you, you could also call it a fine dice, those are pretty interchangeable. And uh, and you know what? Before we show you how to brunoise a shallot, we're going to show you how to dice an onion. Because what we're doing when we do the shallot is we're doing an onion, but smaller. How we sounded? We got some like intermittent mic issues. Oh. They clear up on their own. It's kind of like robotic. Oh, interesting. There's a couple of people being like, is it a battery pack? Or something? Yeah, no. Um, I, think, I think next time we'll just have you on. Uh, yeah, am I, getting, am I getting text? Is that, no? Okay, we did have a few questions on on uh, on TikTok. Yes, the position of the camera did change. I got my camera on a gimbal. Um, mostly, just people making fun jokes. All right. Well, if you have any, uh, if you have any, uh, Sky, if you see any questions on TikTok. Worth answering. Sorry, we're not getting to you, folks. If you are watching on TikTok, thanks for tuning in. Uh, head to Knife War on YouTube if you want to definitely get your question answered, because uh, we're better at answering questions there. That's where we're paying more attention. Somebody did say I could circumcise a gnat with this knife, and they are correct. I've done it. Uh, somebody else said, <laughs> Christopher said, is that a bunka knife? This is a bunka knife. Uh, Frank, at the same time, asked what's your favorite Japanese knife. Currently, it's this one. Uh, it is this Hado Sakai Bunka. Uh, if you check out our TikTok page, we do have a lot of our favorite knives on there now. Okay, onion time. The great onion controversy. There are three different ways to cut an onion. They're all right. Stop arguing. The end. Uh, I like to do it this way. So I, I trim off, I'll show you again. I trim off the top of the onion so that I can see the inside. And then I trim off just the tiniest bit of the end. People cut way too much of the end of the onion off. That is how much I cut off. Right? You want to leave that root intact. And then I cut the onion in half right through the root. Like so. Boop. This makes it way easier to peel. Uh, was somebody roasting me on YouTube? Um, Don Penny. Ah, oh, Don was... Penny. Being sassy, he said, what size dicing would be best for onions uh, for the most efficient means of throwing them in the garbage? <laughs> and that's a hot take, and you're allowed to be wrong. You know what? We, we believe in that here. Oh, uh, yeah. I, uh, I dated somebody that didn't like onions once. It's fine. I helped them recover. They're, 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 they're better now. Um, and then I peel the onion. You know how to do that. I don't need to teach you that. But onions are way easier to peel when they've been cut in half, so don't waste your time. Okay, we have an onion. We have a root on the bottom. Whoop. We have a root on the bottom there. And then we have um, all the petals, all the, all the layers there. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do like a medium dice of onion. So we're going to cut all the way down to the cutting board, but we're not going to cut all the way back to the onion. We want to leave this root intact. So we're going to put our knife maybe three quarters of the way to the back of the onion. We're going to dig the tip straight down, and then we're going to drag it backwards. Straight down, drag it backwards. Straight down, drag it backwards. Right? Boom. Easy peasy. What you end up with is like, whoop, is like a blooming onion, right? Have you ever been to the Calgary Stampede? You have like a root at the bottom and all these layers that are sticking out. 
And then we're just going to cut straight across them. And we're going to do the same thing I've been doing the whole time. Tip down, follow with the belly of the knife. Boom, 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 boom. You end up with a little bit of the end. You can throw that into a vegetable stock or a chicken stock. Or you can also just cut it up because it's easy. But there you go. That's how you dice an onion. Easy peasy. And, uh, and that's like a nice medium to small dice-ish. Um, that's like if I was making chili, that's probably how I'd dice an onion. And, uh, and there you go. If you're doing um, risotto, for example, you're going to want to do finer, right? As I was saying earlier, how you cook something and how you eat it um, is, is going to dictate the, the size you cut things. But also, the role it's going to play in the dish. So in risotto... It's, it's all about the rice, right? The onion's there just kind of like as a playing a supporting role, but you don't really want to know the onion's there. And so you're going to cut it pretty fine so that it basically melts away into the risotto. Um, whereas if you're making a stew, I like big hearty chunks of onion, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it in big pieces. The next way to cut an onion is the exact same as the way I did before, but with more steps. Um, people do this way if they are going for more consistency because the way I did before leaves some pieces that are slightly not unsquare and, and not quite perfect. I don't care. I'm a home cook these days. I don't work in restaurants anymore. When I worked in a French restaurant, I would do it this way. I just don't care anymore. But you're gonna, we're going to make one or two horizontal cuts into the onion like so. We're going to break those layers up a little more so we get more consistent sizes and pieces. Now, the way you don't want to do this is to put your hand back here and cut towards your hand because that's dumb and you're going to cut yourself. So, put your hand on top of the onion so that you don't cut yourself, like so. And I like to use the tip and kind of just score straight through. You'll also notice I've got my knife or my onion over at the edge of the board so that I'm not running into the cutting board with my, left, or with my right hand. So I'm going to make two cuts in this way so that I've broken the onion up like so. Ta -da. Is this the infamous Lordy method, says Don Penny? I don't even remember at this point. Like, there's so much onion discourse that, like, I don't know. I know I don't do the horizontal cuts because Instagram just roasted me one time for not doing them. Uh, all these chefs are getting, like, infuriated. Um, the, fuck, if you want to trigger somebody on the internet, like, don't, forget politics. The easiest way to do it is to, like, talk, just say this is the way to cut an onion. doesn't matter what way you're doing it. Just say this is the way and people will lose their minds. But, we're going to leave that back end intact, and we're going to do the exact same thing we did before. Down and back, down and back, down and back, and it's falling apart. See, this is why I don't like this method, is because you end up with all these loose little bits that fall out right away, and, and that didn't happen before. So I don't like this method. But anyways, you come across, boom, 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 diced onion, Tell me why I suck in the comments. Nathan's canceled. All right. Um, that is way number two to dice an onion. Way number three. We're running out of Ziploc containers here. Way number three is sort of like a hybrid of the first two and also different. So onions, as I mentioned before, they have all these like layers or petals. Insert Shrek reference. And... Basically, we're going to work with those. So, if you look up close to the onion, I'll show YouTube first. See these lines here? They kind of go radially around the onion like so. So, we're going to make cuts in at like, basically like a sun is rising and setting. So, we're going to cut in towards the middle. And it's kind of complicated, so I just have to show you. So, again, leaving the root end intact. Instead of cutting straight down this time, we, God, how do I show you guys? We're going to cut in. No, that doesn't work. We're going to cut in at a really low angle. So we're basically aiming for the middle of the onion and landing on the cutting board. And then the next cut, we're going to raise our angle up a little bit. And a little higher and a little higher until we're up at 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock. And that's when the sun sets right now. 5 o'clock. There we go. So basically, we have the same thing we had for the first method, but now it's all this like radial cut. 
Uh, and it's a great method. The only reason I don't do this is, again, I'm lazy, and you have to, like, do all this thinking about, like, angles and stuff when you do it this way. But it does create a really consistent onion. Um, do the way that makes you happy. You're being canceled for showing both methods. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Flipping the script. Yeah. Um, yeah, they all work great. Um, I like the first one because it's the easiest. Um, but yeah, cut an onion the way that makes you happy. We love, all onions matter here. Okay. So, remember when I said I cut a shallot 10 minutes ago? That was just to show you basically how we're gonna cut a shallot, but smaller. Because when I'm doing it on a shallot, it's gonna be a lot harder to see what I'm doing. So we're gonna grab a shallot. We're gonna cut off the top, we're gonna cut off just a little bit of the root, and we're gonna cut it in half. And we are doing a brunoise. So with this method, we are going to do those, those horizontal cuts in because when you're doing a brunoise, generally it's for something like a mignonette or other things that I can't think of right now, where you, precision's really important. You, it's presentation, you want like the tiniest little bit, you got like a tuna crudo and you just want the tiniest little sprinkles of, of uh, shallot on there. And so we are going for precision here. So we're gonna start by bringing the shallot over to the edge of the cutting board here. We're gonna press down gently with our fingertips. And we're gonna get, we're gonna slice in a little sawing motion and just leave like half an inch at the end or so. And there we go, so that's step one. We wanna break that shallot up into layers like so. And then we're going to take the tip of our knife, we're going to come in, tip down, pull back, tip down, pull back, tip down, pull back, like so. And some, some of these little bits are going to kind of fall out as you're doing this. That's okay, because you can kind of gather them up and just hide them under the shallot so that they get cut as you go. And then we're going to just use our knuckle to carefully guide the thickness of our cut. And there we go. It's pretty straightforward. The shallot does kind of get a little spread out, so every now and then you just have to like pull it back together and regroup a little bit so that you get those nice little consistent cubes. Whoo, she's spicy. Huh. I used to be like bulletproof when it came to like onion vapors and now I'm just a, just a wimp. There you go. So that, that's like a brunoise shallot. That might be a slightly large brunoise because I am slightly out of practice, but uh, I would say that would do the trick beautifully. Uh, again, if you're making risotto and you want really, really tiny bits of allium in there, or if you're doing um, a mignonette for oysters, that kind of thing, because you're taking this really strong pungent ingredient, you're making it to a tiny little piece that you can serve it raw and it's not going to blow your head off. That's the point, is to have a really small delicate presentation and a small delicate flavor. Oh my god, I'm getting emotional. This is like your influencer apology moment. <laughs> sorry, I couldn't I'm sorry, this I'm sorry, you're wrong. <laughs> Subscribe to my Patreon. <laughs> yeah, spicy. Um, <laughs> we're getting a lot of love for uh for a, like a butchery stream in the future. Oh man. Yeah, we were, somebody asked if we were cutting meat today and I was like, we maybe could. We thought about it. Somebody was asking about cutting a fish up and um, <laughs> if you don't know, we're a knifeware. We are, we are a great place to find Japanese kitchen knives and cookware. We are also based in the landlocked province of Alberta in Canada. And so our fish selection is terrible, especially in the winter, um, but we'll totally We'll make it happen. Um, there's a really good uh, Chinese uh, grocery store by my house that sells whole fish. And so maybe we'll do, I'm, I'm pretty mediocre when it comes to like large scale butchery, um, but maybe we get our man Cohen from the Union of Meats to do something with us mm -hmm. sometime. But we could teach you guys some basics. We could do a chicken, we could do a pork shoulder, um, and, and a fish or something like that. If there's specific stuff you want to learn, let, let us know in the comments and we'll, we'll try our best to accommodate. Tweet at Kevin that we need a brisket for work. <laughs> we definitely need a brisket for work. Oh, I should see if my trigger's still working, and then we could eat brisket the next day. That sounds like a great plan yeah. for work purposes. Yeah. I let my smoker on fire, and so I need to make sure it still works. Oh, God. <laughs>
Um, it, was a, it was a moment. <laughs> Adrian is asking, what board is that? I want one. This is a Larchwood Canada board. It is sustainably made in Canada. Larchwood's great because it's not too hard and it's not too soft, so it's easy on your knife edges, but it's not like super soft. It's not gonna gouge up easily. It's end grain, which means uh, instead of cutting with the length of the tree or the height of the tree, they've actually cut across the tree, across the grain, which is why you see all these beautiful rings in here. I'll, I'll show the B camera up close. <laughs> Oh, my nose is running from the onion. Yeah, so you can see the rings of the wood in there. And so that helps your knife stay sharp a little bit better too because you're cutting with the fibers of the wood, so they say. Um, but they're just beautiful. They last basically forever. And because they're end grain and, and really thick, they don't warp easily either. If you take even decent care of it, um, they, they hold together really well. Folks are surprised we're in Alberta. <laughs> Why is that? I always assumed you guys were American. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> we're, we're, we're like uh, America light right now. <laughs> I, uh, I managed to escape America, so I'm, yeah. I'm proto-Canadian now. <laughs> yeah, you came to make Alberta great again. <laughs> oh, yikes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Well, if you are just tuning in, we are, we are from Canada. We are from Knifeware, so we specialize in Japanese kitchen knives. Um, Japanese cookware, uh, many, many of us are former chefs, so all of our kind of cookware, kitchen gadgets are curated by chefs and people that love to cook. Uh, we sell sharpening supplies and other stuff as well. You can shop online at knifeware.com, but if you're in Canada, we are in Calgary, Edmonton, Ottawa, and Vancouver, and we're opening in Toronto uh, this year, hopefully in the spring. Um, we also do things like teach knife skills. We have classes in stores, but we do live streams every month, and we have videos on our YouTube channel about this kind of stuff. If you want to learn more, there's a Knife Skills Basics video, uh, and like, I say basics, but it's like 45 minutes long. Uh, it linked in the description that you can watch later, uh, and it is by our buddy Owen. It's kind of like our Knife Skills class that we do in store. So if you want to learn some more rudimentary stuff, less advanced than we're doing today, it's a good place to learn it. Um, yeah, any other questions or comments we need to get to? No, I think we're good to get it on to the, the chiffonade. chiffonade. Okay, so chiffonade is just a really fancy cut for, it's another presentation cut similar to shallots. And, and although I'm not like super fussy about food presentation at home, this is one that I do like to, to utilize. Um, and it's basically for any fine leafy herb um, like mint, because if you, if you go over, like you know how people cut parsley and they just mince it and, and, and just chop it into oblivion? That bruises the, the, the herb, and so if you're pre-cutting things, if you're working in a restaurant and you're cutting your stuff before service, um, it's gonna be like just sad and, and wilted and bruised by the time service comes around. But it's also going to make all of the essential oils and all the flavors in it break down. And so the idea with a brunoise is a very delicate cut where you get to actually see a little more of the leaf and you get a little more of the flavor, but it's still very delicate. So if you're using strong herbs like mint, um, it's not going to overwhelm uh, what you're making. You know, we do a chiffonade of mint quite often on desserts. We do a chiffonade of basil uh, to finish off a pasta sauce or, um, I mean, so many different places. But it, it's a really great cut to be able to do. So it's really simple. You just take the whole leaves of whatever herb you're using. In this case, I'm using mint because it's winter and we can't get good basil. <laughs> It'd be like $10. Um, but you just stack them up like so. And, and what a lot of people like to do, if you've ever seen Mike's videos, he likes to take this and then he likes to roll it up into like a little mint doobie and then slice that. Um, and I don't because it's, I don't, because I don't, because there's no need. Because um, <laughs> I like to be a little more gentle with the herbs and I find that rolling method just kind of bruises it. So instead, I just basically set it on the cutting board straight up and down like so. And then I cut across it at about a 45 degree angle. And this is where using that knuckle to guide the cuts and looking at what you're doing is really important. Because I'm just doing, probably even hard to see on camera, but I'm just gently passing the knife through the herb. I'm using very little pressure and I'm barely moving my fingers back. I'm bringing the knife back and I'm just finding the smallest amount of herb that I can cut and then I'm gently sliding the knife forward. And then bringing it back sliding it forward. And so if you're doing this slowly, if you haven't done this before, you just really want to take your time and just cut the tiniest amount of mint possible with each slice. 
This isn't the kind of thing where speed is really important because we're going for precision and we're trying not to bruise this delicate herb. Because if you do it well, you can cut your mint in the morning and serve it in the evening and it'll still be really nice. Um, usually they, it wouldn't hang out that long. Like we'd cut, chiffonade would usually be done right before service, last thing on the, your prep list. Um, and then you just stick it in the refrigerator. But if you do it well, the herb will hold up for hours without breaking down. And then you get this, this nice little pile of fine, fine shreds of mint. And you can garnish all sorts of stuff with that. Again, really nice for working herbs into like a, a pasta sauce at the very end or just uh, just tossing over like a grilled chicken breast or something. It's, it's very versatile. Nice way to add greenery and flavor uh, to a final plate or a dessert. Yeah. That's, uh, that's chiffonade. It's, pre it's pretty, all this stuff's pretty straightforward. None of it's all that hard. It just takes practice to do well. And, and really, when you're learning, it's not about speed. It's about taking your time to, 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 to just dial it in, aim that knife really carefully, and just follow through. And just, it's like zen. Like, you just, you know, you have a cocktail, you spend a little time slicing that mint, and you just enjoy it. Um, I've been using this knife for a while. So I'm going to talk a little bit about knife maintenance because every time you touch your knife on the cutting board, it gets just a tiny bit more dull. Now, the better cut your cutting board is, the less your knife is going to dull. If you're using glass or bamboo, your knife's going to dull really fast. If you're using a decent wood cutting board or like a softer board like this Hazagawa, I was going to use this guy today, but it doesn't look very good on camera. But it's a nice soft rubber cutting board. And your knife's not going to dull as fast, but eventually it's going to go dull. And especially for delicate cuts like that brunoise, it's really hard to be precise if your knife is not sharp. So every so often, every hour or so of work, I like to tune up the edge of the knife. Um, I think we've all seen how to use a honing rod, straight up and down, 15 degrees for your Japanese knife, nice and gentle, right? But if presentation really matters to you and you're really going for uh, really delicate cuts, you might want to grab yourself a leather strop and get in the habit of stropping your knives because it just takes your edge that a little more beyond. It's really good for the knife nerds who want like the best edge possible on their knife every time they use it, like me, or for the people who just need like the absolute precision. Uh, you know, if you are cutting sashimi all the time and you need your knife to be as smooth as possible going through that raw fish, you're gonna want a leather strop. So it's similar to using the, the ceramic coating rod. You're gonna set your strop flat on whatever surface you're working on. You can hold it up in the air, but I find Putting it on the table is easier to be precise. We're going to set the knife at 15 degrees and we're going to lead with the spine of the knife. We're not going to lead with the edge because then we'll just cut our strop. But we're just almost like we're spreading peanut butter across the strop. Just nice smooth motions like so. You can go heel to tip as well. I do a bit of both. Um, our strops have two sides. We've got a suede side and a leather side. I like to use the suede side first followed by the leather side, like so. And what this is gonna do is, it's just gonna grab any microscopic burrs of steel on your edge that are just a little bit rough, getting a little bit in the way of the edge, and it's just gonna smooth them out. It's just gonna make that edge as nice as can be. So this knife's starting to get a nice patina to it. We've uh, been using it for a couple weeks, but it's really starting to pick up color today. Um, you'll, you'll probably notice, I'll show you my shallots I cut a few minutes ago. Um, if you're using a carbon steel knife for the first time, or you know, if, if you have a brand new carbon steel knife like I do, um, when you cut things that are acidic, like onions and shallots, they're going to start to change color after a while. They react with the steel, and it helps your steel change color, but it also can discolor the food you're cutting. Um, and so if you're just throwing it into a soup, not a big deal. But if you are cutting shallots to serve raw as presentation in a restaurant or for dinner guests, uh, you might want to use a stainless steel knife or you might want to use a carbon steel knife that's built up a patina so that it doesn't react and, and discolor the vegetable. Cool. Uh, I'm going to talk about cutting up a pepper next, but do we have any questions in the meantime? Um, got a couple of questions going on. We were talking a little bit about um, whether you'd be turning a mushroom. 
No. To which I said no, because you haven't been dead. Hell no. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I've never done it well, and it's not necessary. <laughs> Is that Chef Mex trolling me again? Uh, <laughs> no, this okay. was Adrian. Um, Adrian, if you were sincerely asking, I'm sorry, but I just, yeah. I will do, I'll turn, I'll turn some vegetables, old school style. Um, I did work in a French restaurant for a while, and while I do love a lot of the fancy, froofy detail stuff, I do not believe in cutting off half a vegetable and throwing it out so that you can have it look less like a vegetable. It doesn't make sense to me. Which is what we're planning on doing later. <laughs> yeah, right? I'm a bit of a naturalist when it comes to food, which means I think the ingredient should look like the ingredient that it is as mm. much as possible. Uh, Joycey51 asked, Knife War London 2024? <laughs> London, Ontario, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, talk to Kevin. I mean, as far, other than Toronto, I think he's most eager to open in London because he lived there for almost a decade and, and really liked it. Um, oh, you know, if I had to go visit London sometimes, I wouldn't be sad. Yeah. Uh, B asked, assuming you've left the kitchen industry, uh, yeah. did you leave it for this exactly? Yes. Yes, I did. I actually didn't see any way out of the kitchen industry, and I hadn't even considered leaving restaurants. Um, don't get me wrong, I was unhappy working in restaurants. Um, there's a, this isn't about something I'm going to say about every restaurant, but a lot of the restaurants I worked in had very toxic culture, um, which is something I can't tolerate, and, uh, and was physically hard on my body. And I was 21. I had been in the rest industry since I was 13, and... At 21, I was having problems with my body, um, and that wasn't going to get any better the older I got. Uh, and so I just got a job with Kevin at Knifeware because I just I needed a break from restaurants for a little while while I was going through cooking school, finishing up my second year, and uh, and they hired me on part time. And it was the luckiest day in my life because I've been there now. I've been here for 10 years as of this week, I think. What's the date? can't see it's certainly one of them i think i started on like the 26th or 27th so I, mm. i've been here 10 years like today or tomorrow oh, wow. um and uh yeah it's been awesome because um amazing company culture um we get paid well we get health benefits we get taken care of really well but we still get to be involved with knives and food and stuff that we love and and be really close to the industry because i still have a lot of love for chefs and for for kitchens and uh and i'd be sad if i had to be totally away from that because food is what makes me happy so yeah Cool. I did leave for knifeware. All right. Uh, Roger F. asks, for those of us new to Japanese, Japanese knives and who don't have any stone sharpening experience, mm. should you hone, strop, or do both to your brand new knife? Um, if you're just going to do one, I'd hone. This will bring your knife back from a point, more of a point of no return. Uh, eventually, that's going to get so dull that it just has to be sharpened on a whetstone. But the, the rod's going to bring it back from a worse point than the strop is. Um, you can also use this on like, I have my Henkel's knife still and I use this on my Henkel's knife. Um, so, so it's a great tool. Um, but I have both and I use both at home and they, they both work really well. Cool. Yeah. Um, I, I saw somebody just saying on TikTok, Reese Jones, if you're still watching, uh, I'm starting off as a chef. What knives do you recommend for building your knife set? There are two that you need to start with. You need a chef's knife and a pairing or utility knife. And that's it. Uh, a, a, eight or 10 inch chef's knife. If you're, t I'm six foot tall, I like a 10 inch chef's knife. If that's uncomfortable to you, get a, get a six or eight inch. But uh, a good chef's knife and something a little bit smaller for doing little jobs, I could cut every type of food that I need to cut with these two knives. And then eventually you can get a boning knife and a bread knife and blah, blah, blah. All right. Uh, what apron are you rocking? This is the Search and Rescue uh, black label, no gold label. Um, they're made in Vancouver, so they're Canadian made, which is awesome. They're really sturdy. They do free repairs for life. I mean, if your apron like burns in a fire, they won't repair that. But like if it's worn out where you keep your cell phone or you, you know, you rub up against the counter and the middle starts to wear out, they will fix that for you. Um, they're sturdy, they're, but they're not too heavy. So like if you run a little hot like I do, they're still a reasonable temperature to wear. They also have the X back. So if you don't wear a collared shirt, they're way more comfortable than like a neck strap apron. They're really good. We also sell medium rare, which are also really nice. They're a Calgary-based company. But my number one go-to is the search and rescue. 
All right. We're all caught up for the time being. Thanks awesome. for the question, guys. Yeah, thanks for your great questions. Keep them coming. Uh, if there's other stuff you want to see me do, specific skills or cut specific things, if we have the supplies to do it, we will. Next, I'm going to show you a trick that I like using for a pepper, bell pepper. This isn't really an advanced knife skill, but it's something we teach in all our classes, and I think it's very valuable. Because normally, most people, when they cut a pepper, they cut it in half, and they split that core up, and the seeds go everywhere, and it's a mess. So this is an, an easier way to do it. We're going to cut off the top and the bottom, and then we're going to remove the core surgically. And so, basically, it's easy. You need a sharp knife. You cut off about that much of the bottom. Boop. We're not throwing this out. We're going to cut that up later. And then we're going to cut off the top. We're, we're going to leave this base of the stem on. So we want to cut just above there, like so. Boom, boom, boom. Then we're going to cut down the side, so the tip of our knife. Lay the pepper on its side, slice out the ribs like so. If you're real fancy, you can do it in one smooth motion. There's your pepper, all right? There's the evil core of the pepper with all its disgusting seeds. That's gonna go straight in the compost. And then you have lots of pepper with nary a seed in sight. And so now we can do whatever we want with this. Uh, say we want a fine boulevard of pepper. We will take our pepper we're gonna, here's, here's a bit of an advanced trick. So lay your hand on top of the pepper. Uh, have the knife edge level with the cutting board, parallel with the cutting board. And then about halfway up, just gently cut in and then saw through. And the idea is we're trying to cut this pepper into two, two layers. Like so. Boom. And then it's half as thick, and so we can come through. If your knife is sharp, you can cut straight through the skin easily. Making sure we rock the blade just a little bit to follow through. There we go, we have some nice fine pepper julienne that we could put into a slaw. We want a little, little slaw for our tacos or something. Or if we wanted to get real fancy, we could kind of line some of it up like so. And then make like a little pepper, a pepper julienne. And sometimes I will do that cut where I leave the tip on the cutting board. If I have a little pile of stuff that I'm slicing through, I will just let that tip of the knife rub up against the cutting board so I can glide the knife a little more easily. We have a little bell pepper confetti right there. Another thing I like to do with the pepper, because often when I make stir fries, I end up throwing some bell pepper in there. So you take, you take one of these little sheets of pepper from the side and you slice it down the middle. So you have two strips, and then we we're gonna run them straight across our cutting board. We're gonna run the knife at about 45 degrees, and then we're just gonna space them out a little bit. And we're gonna cut maybe I don't know half an inch pieces, but you end up with these nice pepper diamonds. I mean, you also end up with a whole bunch of little triangles that are misshapen. But, if you are going for some presentation cuts. Whoop. What? Oh, you want some? Okay, there we go. Yeah, so, that's a, that's a cool way to cut a pepper. Next up, let's make some gazpacho later. Chef Max wants us to break out the dankas. Break out the danka? Oh, I almost brought my danka, and then I grabbed my moritaka and said, sorry, Chef Max. Our man, Chef Max, in Banff is awesome. I think, I think he's in Banff. Um, has, has like a set of like five or six denkas, and that's like all he uses, and it's awesome. <laughs> you get to see him on Instagram all the time using them. It's pretty rad. Okay, so this next cut, before we get on to any more questions, if you have questions, pop them in the comments now, because we're gonna have a little Q&A period coming up pretty quick here. Um, this is the cut that got me onto the idea of doing this live stream in the first place. We, we did one a couple weeks ago where we talked about how to maintain your kitchen knives. 
and I thought, hey, why don't we, and I, oh yeah, right, I was making a avocado toast for breakfast, um, and, and just doing like a fancy cut, and I thought, hey, this is a nice little cut that people might struggle to do at home, but see on TikTok and want to do, and so I figured it'd be fun to show people how to do some fancier cuts, and got into this whole idea, and you guys made so many great suggestions, so this is how to do an avocado fan. So basically, we're going to start with a ripe, just barely ripe avocado. If your avocado is super ripe, this isn't going to work. So you want it just ripe enough that it tastes good, but not so ripe that it's just like mush. We're going to cut our avocado in half. Cut our avocado in half. I'm just going to use the knife to take the pit out, but I'm going to probably chip this knife. Then we're going to just very gently and carefully, this is not the right spoon for this job, but that's okay. Carefully scoop this avocado out of its avocado shell, whatever that's called. And, you know, try to use a better spoon than me, but whatever. That looks fine. And then ba basically what we're going to do is we're going to use the tip of the knife. We use our finger uh, of our left hand, our knuckle of our left hand to guide the knife again. And we're going to just drag the blade through. The idea here is you you want as little of the knife surface to contact the avocado as possible. Because if you cut straight down, it's going to end up sticking and it's not going to stay in line. So you're just dragging the tip of the knife through. Like so. And you can do these cuts as thin or as thick as you want. I usually don't do them this thin at home, but the steak is showing off on the internet. And then you're going to take half of this away. You're going to set this guy off to the side. And then you're just going to basically lay that out like it's a deck of cards. And there you go. And you have your fancy avocado for your dragon, dynamite, Buddha, tempura, sushi roll, or whatever. Fancy. Fancy Canadian avocado sushi toast for Valentine's Day. Exactly. Fancy avocado toast, which is usually what I do this for. Um, it's not me flexing. Like, we, for some reason, avocados are really cheap right now in Canada. You can buy, like, bags of them for, uh, you got a big bag of avocados for, like, six bucks. And, and my, my daughter eats them a lot, too. She's uh, pretty young and needs soft foods. And so, uh, yeah, we just often have avocados around. And uh, so I've been making fancy avocado toast, and it's pretty fun. Another way you can use this technique is if you want to add height to your dishes. And that's something we don't talk about too much. Um, but when you're working in a restaurant, uh, you know, obviously presentation is a lot more important than it is at home. Um, and you see, so you find some pretty creative ways to make dishes stand out. And so at the French restaurant I used to work at, we used to do like a tomato avocado salad with just really simple but nice ingredients. And so we'd slice the avocado, not as thin, maybe into 10 pieces, but it's important to have some structural integrity here. But we'd use a sharp knife, and the people who didn't have sharp knives didn't get to do this. And then, so we make those cuts in, and then we just fan it out this way, like so. Well, I haven't done this for a little while, I'm a little out of practice. But yeah, then you have a little great wall of avocado, and that can be like, kind of like a dividing line between different ingredients in your dish or, or something. Or it can just be like a, 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 nice, a nice way to add a little bit of height to the plate. You could also like curl it and kind of like wrap it around, you know, and like nestle some like mixed greens in the middle or something like that if you wanted. Um, but yeah, it's like a nice way to show off that's not like over the top. And isn't, it isn't hard, it just takes a little practice. I, I got it the first, like, second time I did it, I think. Mmm, avocado. Cool. That was the cut I really wanted to show people. <laughs> now we can go, we're done. No, I'm kidding. Uh, we, have, we have some more stuff to cut. Uh, we're going to cut, we're going to do some citrus segments. We're going to show you how to turn vegetables the old-fashioned way. I'm going to fail at it. We're going to cut, oh, potato accordion, that's a good one. 
I'm gonna do a little katsuramuki. I'm gonna fail at that too. We're gonna, and then we're gonna do a pineapple and a melon. And we were gonna do, somebody asked about big vegetables, so I was gonna grab a squash and I forgot. So, I'm fired. We have a melon. That's a, melon. a big, ve- melon. big vegetable. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you wanna do some Q&A or wait a little bit? Yeah, let's do some Q&A. Cool, yeah. Uh, all right, Giuseppe asks, uh, how long can Japanese knives be kept in proper storage like a knife bag? I tend to use one knife until it gets dull and move on to the next so and sharpen them all at once. And uh, I, I thought I was the only one, Giuseppe. <laughs> I do the same thing. I, I use a knife until it's absolutely unusable and then I move on to the next knife and ruin it too. Um, uh, how long can it be kept in a knife roll? Uh, indefinitely, but make sure it's Dry, 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 dry. Even if it's stainless steel, make sure it's as dry as humanly possible. Then put some oil on it. Put some blade oil on it. If you don't have blade oil, use some mineral oil. You don't want to use canola or olive oil because it will go rancid and get disgusting. If you're going to put your knife in a guard like this especially, you don't just want to pop the knife in there and let that sit because what you end up doing is rusting your knife really bad. Uh, We had a video come out last summer where Mike showed us off his knife roll. And he had this knife, which was super rusty on the back. And now to restore it, we just posted the video a couple weeks ago. But if you watch the beginning of that video, the knife was super rusty. And, uh, and you could still see some pitting in the blade. And so if you let your knife sit for months or even years, it will get really rusty. So make sure it's really dry and then give it a coat of oil. In the same vein, mm-hmm. uh, Iceman asks, how do I remove stain from the knife? Stain from the knife. Um... Barkeeper's friend is the best way. Um, it's a fine powder meant for like cleaning pots and pans and stuff. Um, but I find it's the best material to move, remove stains from your knife without scratching it up. Sometimes you can use like the scrubby side of a sponge, but they will scratch up the finish of your knife. So I would use Barkeeper's friend. If you can't get that, you could use baking soda and just like a damp sponge or a damp cloth, dab it, and then use the baking soda. It's a very mild abrasive. We also have a live stream that we did last week on how to take care of your oh, new knife. Right. So you can also scrub through there. I think we yeah. put a chapter Yeah, it's that. on our live streams playlist and our most recent playlist, and there's chapters there. Yeah. Um, and our good friend Owl Woodworks asks, Hey. River jumps, do you have them? Can he have them? I'm, I might know a guy. Yeah. yeah, we might know somebody. Yeah, yeah just shoot, me a, shoot us a DM on the old Instagram owl um and ask for nathan um i might i might know a guy (laughs) all right and stay tuned if you are looking for a rare knife we got we got a tank we got a a river jump and we got a a mini tank coming in so Mm -hmm. and we also have a couple of questions on tiktoks that are asking to show off individual knives today we're just going to focus on advanced knife skills so Mm. we're not going to address those right now but you can tune into future live streams and also all of the videos that we have on tiktok are more or less showing like, off knives showing off <laughs> yeah. knives so that's yeah. the place to go um, but if you do want to see knives specific knives um maybe leave a comment on one of our videos asking us to show off that knife and we'll add it we'll make like a list or or and maybe we'll just do a live stream where we just show off a bunch of knives and cut some stuff with them so yeah if that's thanks for doing it TikTok want. and yeah let us know if you want to see that okay next time I'm, I'm going to segment an orange um i prefer to do this with kind of a medium to large knife, but I'm going to do it with a paring knife because that's what a lot of people do. Um, if you're going to segment an orange, don't use a knife smaller than this because you're just making it hard for yourself. I, I find a 135 millimeter petty is perfect for this. Um, and basically segmenting is taking all the delicious fruit out of the orange with none of the pesky fiber or you know stuff that's in there that gives you vitamins and whatnot. It's a really nice way to cut oranges for salads or to serve with like a nice piece of seared seafood, seared fish. Um, It's a fancy cut. Again, it's not one you're going to do all the time, unless you have a seven-month-old baby, in which case you're going to do this all the time. Uh, I cut orange this way for my daughter because she's starting solid foods and uh, and loves orange. It gives her vitamin C, and she can eat it this way without choking. So that's good. Um, So we're going to cut off the top and the bottom, and then we're going to peel the orange. We're going to do it with a knife. So we're going to start at the very top there. We're going to slice in. We want to slice enough so that we see a nice circle of the flesh. You don't want to see any of the white junk in the middle there, except for that that part. And we're going to do the same thing on the bottom. Oh, this is a good orange. It smells delicious. God damn. Um, and then we're going to use the knife to peel the orange. And in order to do this nicely so that it looks good, 
We're going to slide the knife. People like to saw back and forth and hack at it when they do this. Don't do that. Uh, we're going to slide forward, and as we slide forward, we're going to curve around the curvature of the orange. So this takes a little practice to get the hang of. This is a bit of a tricky motion uh, to get right, but um, it, really, it really works nicely. So you're going to start with your knife right behind the white there. You just want to see the slightest amount of orange behind it. Then we're going to get in with the tip of the knife and follow through and just work around like so. But, and you might leave a little bit behind there. That's okay, we can just trim that off. The goal is in one clean motion to get a nice chunk of peel off but not remove too much of the fruit. Yeah, it's a awesome orange. I'm gonna go have to go back to Superstore and buy more of these. And right at the end to finish that cut, I do like to pull the knife back a little bit, but I'm not. Some people do this where they like saw back and forth like that, and it's just it gives you less control, and it, it just looks just looks crappy. So don't do that. Yeah, we're just gonna gently peel the orange. Um, usually, because I do this a lot at home, I just compost these peels, but if you're doing this once in a while, you can actually dry these peels out and, and pulverize them and use them as seasoning in stews or like on meat. Dried orange peel is really good on like pork for tacos. You use it like a bay leaf in a stew. But that's what we want. We want a peeled orange where all we see is the meat and the, and the white lines along the side. And then what we're going to do is we're going to hold it up in our hand. If you're uncomfortable doing this, because it's slippery, you can do this on the cutting board, but I do it in my hand. We're going to cut just to one side of that white line. We're not cutting on the line, we're cutting right next to it, down to the middle. We don't want to cut all the way through the orange. Then we go to the other side of that segment, and we cut down towards the middle, and we almost cut our finger like I did, and then we have this beautiful segment. And it takes a bit of practice to get the hang of connecting the two cuts. Then we're going to move to the other side of that white line. We're going to cut. We're going to cut. Boom. And you can do this over a bowl or a container so that you can capture all the juice that drips off and add that to the vinaigrette of your salad. Whoop. If you don't quite connect the cuts, you can just like turn the knife and do a little like horizontal guy to remove it. But the more you do this and the better you get easier it gets. But again, we don't want to waste too much of the orange. Now this is obviously a bit of a wasteful cut, um, but I honestly just eat the inside afterwards. You can also just like juice it, squeeze all the juice out and add that to whatever you're making. But it's just, it's a lovely cut. It's really pretty. It's safe for like kids over six months to eat. And uh, and it's just awesome, because then you end up with like all these juicy, shiny jewels of orange goodness uh, that are really hard to not just eat, because they're really good. Mmm. Goddamn. Yeah. It's a weird cut, but, uh, but I really like it. And then you have this like, I'm going to date myself a bit here, you have this like orange Rolodex left over at the end. That, that, that's how you know you've done a good job, is if you get the orange Rolodex. Awesome. If you got any questions, we can pop those in while I clean up. Otherwise, yeah. move on to the next one. Um, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce that name. It's but a weird is, name. is there a specific shape or finish that's best to prevent food from sticking to the blade in general? Mmm. Um, yes and no. If you have a narrow knife, the less surface area there is, the less surface area there is for food to stick to. So you could use a pe petty knife like this. I actually use this knife for a lot of stuff, but you don't necessarily want to do everything with it. Um, yeah, it's hard to say. Sometimes we, you know, we say or we have said in the past that like this rough hammering texture could help with food release. I haven't done like a scientific test of that side by side. So I, I couldn't tell you for sure. Um, what does help with food release? As I mentioned earlier, 
is knives that are sharpened in a specific way. So this is Hato Sakai Bunka, um, and they've sharpened this knife so it's skinnier at the front and thicker at the back. So when you push forward, as you get to that thicker section of the knife, it forces the food to peel away from the knife. Uh, Masashi-san sharpens his knives the same way. So if you get a knife from Masashi or from Hato Sakai, those, those would both be better for, for that. Um, yeah. All right. Iceman was asking, how often do you wipe your knife when you cut acid vegetables, uh, like a couple of onions? Yeah, so I assume we have a carbon, we're using a carbon steel knife. Yeah. I will cut a couple of onions and then I'll wipe the knife. Um, I won't wipe in between. Um, it's actually good for the, the, the acid. Uh, Did I take some acid? Blank it out. Um, it's actually good for the acidic juices to sit on the blade for a little while because it gets that oxidization process going. Oxidization on a knife is not a bad thing, right? If you look at my Moritaka, I've had this knife for like 12 years. It is very oxidized. It's very kind of gray. It's almost a little bit brown. Almost looks a little borderline rusty sometimes, but it's, it's been oxidized. This is called a patina, and it, it's similar to rust, but it isn't rust. It's a protective kind of oxidization that almost seals off the surface of the knife so that it doesn't rust as easily. Um, it rusts a lot less easily, actually. This is a brand new-ish Hado Sumi Bunka that's just starting to build that patina. You can just see it was very shiny on the edge and now it's getting a little more cloudy and eventually it'll turn a much darker gray, even black color, um, but that takes time. And so letting that onion juice sit for a few extra seconds is a good thing. Um, as soon as I'm done chopping those two onions though, I will wipe the knife. Basically, if the knife is in motion, you're good. But if, if you set the knife down and walk away for any amount of time, that's when it's going to start rusting. If you're cutting a 50-pound bag of onions, I would wipe the knife every 10 onions or so, or 5 onions even. But if you're just doing a couple at home, um, chop the onions, then wipe the knife. Awesome. Oh, Grant. I don't know if Grant's watching, but I said I would talk a bit about using skinnier knives with flatter bellies. He asked about a Kiritsuke or a slim knife. This is a Gyuto, but this is a fairly slim knife. If you compare it to my new Bunka, it's not nearly as tall. And and uh, a lot of people might not like this. It's a more a little more of a traditional shape for a Gyuto, I think. But uh, but I really like it. It does give you less knuckle clearance, but it's rare that the heel of the knife is sitting down on the cutting board. And even if it is, I still have you know, a centimeter of knuckle clearance. I like this style of knife because I do more of a sliding cut. And so I kind of angle it up a little more, but I do follow through quite a bit. And it's, it's really nice. I actually, it feels a little more nimble for me. I tend to work more in the, in the middle and the front of the knife than I would around the heel. And so that style is, is really good for that. Um, I don't know what else I can say about it. The nice thing is that you don't have to rock it as much as I did with that bunka. You can kind of just come straight down and you have more edge contact in the cutting board. And so it's a little better for those push and pull cuts if you like to do those. Okay. The next cut I'm going to do is, oh God, oh, is turning a potato. Woo! Okay, so if you've ever had the pleasure of going, and I, I mean that sincerely, if you've ever had the pleasure of going to a traditional French restaurant, um, it's, it's really cool because there's a lot of like love and care that goes into making the food. And some of it is unnecessary in my humble opinion. But uh, it's, it's, it's almost like, uh, you know, time traveling. Like you're going back and seeing a style of cooking that for a long time in the West at least was the way to cook food. Um, you know, that was back in a time when restaurants were a lot less accessible. And I think we've come long ways by making food and dining out more accessible and by including more cuisines in our, in our cultural lexicon. But I do really love the traditional French techniques and, and, and restaurants because there's, they're just, there's something magical about them. You know, it's all about putting on a show for the customer. It's, very, it's a very customer-centric uh, way of cooking. And so they do these things called turned vegetables, where you'd have, uh, you'd have a Chateaubriand, for example, which is beef tenderloin, roast, specific part of the tenderloin. And, you know, they'd roast it, they'd, they'd bring it out to the table for you and, and show you the roast. 
um, before finishing it in the oven. Like it's it's a whole thing. They serve it with Bernays sauce, which is awesome. Uh, just buttery, tarragon-y, delicious sauce. Um, and often they would have turned vegetables on the side as the as as the vegetable component. And so uh, they would do it's it's very traditional meat meat and potatoes and, and some roast vegetables. But they would make all these vegetables into like these little similar little pieces. And, and I'm not sure entirely what the thinking was behind it, but you ended up with some pretty neat looking stuff. And so the idea was you would take a potato, throw one that's a bit smaller than this, and you trim it down so that you have, oh, you trim it down so that you have seven equal sizes. And I think the point is just to, you know, it's like when you see like a guitarist soloing on stage. Like you're just wanking a little bit and showing off, but you end up with something that's pretty neat. And so um, let's just do it. Enough talking, I guess. I can't delay any longer. So I cut off the top and the bottom, and then you'd use your knife. Often they'll use more of a bird's beak shaped knife, but I never really like those. This guy's probably a little big for the job. You might want something a little shorter and a little skinnier. But you basically trim towards your hand, and you just work in this curved sort of motion, working around the potato. Have you ever seen somebody peel a potato with a knife? Same thing, sort of. And, like, obviously you don't throw away that potato because restaurant, restaurant margins are razor thin and it's a good way to go out of business. You probably throw that into a mashed potato. And, oh, did I do it? I did mediocre, but I did seven sides. Yeah, it's a pretty crap job. But that, that's basically how it would look. It might be a little smaller than that, but you end up with something that's, like, you know, just kind of trimmed and petite looking. And when you get five or six little pieces of vegetable all in the same plate that, that have all been turned that way, that are all different colors, it, it's quite pretty looking. Um, as I said before, I'm, I'm a naturalist when it comes to food. I think, yeah, I got nothing against dicing an onion because it's a great way to integrate an onion to stuff, but for the most part, I think food should look like food, and I think keeping a potato looking like a potato is a beautiful thing. You know, potatoes are a beautiful vegetable, especially if you've ever had the joy of growing your own. Um, they're, they're incredible, and, and I think you disrespect the potato by stripping it down like that, but it's, it's a relic of, uh, of our culinary past, and I think it's still cool to, to learn and to practice, and uh, yeah, whoever suggested it clearly worked in a restaurant and just wanted to see me suffer. <laughs> but you can do that with anything, any root vegetable, any dense vegetable, you can, you can turn like that. Try a carrot. So yeah, you start with flat ends, and then you just basically have your thumb on the top, and then just carefully, carefully bring the knife towards yourself. Like so. The trick is figuring out the spacing. You want to rotate your vegetables so that each time you come down, you're not cutting too much off because you do want seven sides. That is. A lot of the traditional French cooking is all about rules. And also you don't want to have to go back and even it out because that's a waste of time. And you need to be able to do like 200 of these in a very short amount of time. But um, yeah, seven sides. Has to have seven sides. The sides have to be an equal thickness. For, it has to look the same whatever angle you look at it from. Ta-da! I'm actually like not terrible at this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure somebody will, will will say I am, but like, I'm pretty impressed. I haven't worked in a French restaurant for 10 years, so that's uh, that's not the worst. Okay. What do we want to do next? There's the carrot bin. Cats are a mookie. Cats are a mookie. Oh, God. No, potato, uh, potato accordion. Okay, okay. Potato we can do it. See, the accordion cut, the TikTok accordion cut is like probably, people probably think it's harder, but I find them a lot easier. So, okay, so these are... We've all seen that that uh, video on TikTok, and it's it's often a Chinese chef because their knife skills are like just put ours to shame. Um, but they square off a vegetable, and then make a whole bunch of really fine cuts one way, and make a whole bunch of really fine cuts the other way. And sometimes they do other fancy stuff, and then you end up with this like beautiful potato lattice or accordion. Um, and I, it's it's easier than it looks. Like it's not easy to do well, but it's easier than it looks. Um, so you're going to start by trimming the ends off your potato. 
I've done this with a cucumber. This is my first time doing it with potatoes, so hopefully I don't embarrass myself. But we're going to basically square it off. We're just going to, we're going to go nuts. We're going to trim off a whole bunch of potato here. I'm making mashed potato for dinner. What's everybody having for dinner tonight? I'm having a treat. I'm having ribeye and mashed potatoes. Uh, What's the occasion? Uh, it's Friday. <laughs> <laughs> and also, like, we haven't been eating a lot of meat because meat's just so horrendously expensive. So I was just like, screw it. We're having a steak tonight because we deserve it. And <laughs> steak is a rare occasion these days. So, okay. So after all that trimming, we're left with potato cube. Finally, potato cube. <laughs> That's the most cubey potato I've ever seen. It's not terrible. It's pretty bad up close, but it's good enough for camera. Um, okay, so we're going to cut down. We're going to make a whole bunch of really fine cuts, but we don't want to cut all the way through. Now, if you are a super skilled chef, you can just stop partway through. I'm not, so I'm going to cheat, and I'm going to angle my knife so that the tip of the knife hits the cutting board, and my knife only goes so much through the potato. And we're just going to boom, 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 like so. This works. I don't look like such an idiot if it doesn't. Um, yeah. Oh, that's that's very, very pleasing. It's kind of wobbly. Okay. <laughs> oh no. Okay. If it doesn't work, you have to eat the whole raw potato. That's fair. Well, I'm gonna break this part off because that part's gonna break anyways. Mm -hmm. No, not. no. Commit. All right. All right. Committing. Okay. Now we're just gonna turn our knife 45 degrees like so. We're gonna do the exact same thing. Nathan, terrible. this is advanced knife skills. <laughs> like, it should be hard. <laughs> yeah, it kind of worked. I think with the potato, because it's so dense, you have to make some cuts in the side. Mm. No, because then it would go, I don't know. Clearly, I'm no pro. But you can do it with a cu cucumber. It's actually a really fun way to make a cucumber salad. Same thing. Boom. Cut down. Ari says, feeling the urge to dice and caramelize a bag of onions right now. Oh, man, I love doing that. You just, like, that's a good way to practice your knife skills. Like, straight up, if you want to get good at using a knife, like, just, I don't care what kind of cut you do. Fine dice, slice, whatever. Just cut, like, 10 pounds of onions. And you will be much better at cutting by the time you're done. And then, and then just caramelize them. And then you just have caramelized onions for, like, the next year. I like to do that. And then I'll add some red wine, some beef stock, and reduce it down. And then you just take that goop and put it in your freezer. And anytime you want French onion dip, you take some of that and mix it in with sour cream and, and mayo. And then you have, like, the most killer French onion dip of your life. <laughs> so good. Okay. We made our cuts this way. We're going to roll this guy over 180 degrees. Then we're going to do the angled cut on the 45. And I like doing this for, like, a fresh cucumber salad in the summer. I'm going to throw some chili, some sesame oil, some sesame seeds. Oh, ooh, ooh, fancy. Yeah. Yeah, the potato accordion, I think I need to practice that one. I'm not good at that one, but I can do, do the cucumber accordion. All right. That's enough of that. Okay, now we get to do katsuro muki. Oh. This is this part of show, the show is called Nathan Embarrasses Himself. <laughs> uh, Ketsuro Muki is a Japanese cut, and basically it's, it's, it's rotary peeling, so you're using the knife to create a really thin shaving. So same as many of these cuts, you want to have really clean ends. And Naoto's better at this than me. Um, watch his Japanese knife skills video. We're just going to start, we're just going to clean up this daikon really quick. And somebody actually asked how to do katsuramuki with a double bevel knife. Traditionally, in Japan, you would do this with an usuba. I actually find it easier with a yanagiba, but um, I'm not good with those knives. And so I actually prefer to do it with a double bevel knife. So whoever asked for that, thank you. Okay. 
So, whew, it's been a while since I've done this, but you want to start by making a little incision in, go up to the daikon, and then you just gently push, I, I just saw up and down ever so slightly. The tricky thing here is that you're putting your thumb directly towards the blade. So you will just cut yourself at some point doing this. But if you're careful, like I'm, a, I'm a real hack at this, so don't judge me, but there we go. Okay, so I, I like to have my right hand thumb kind of up above the edge of the blade. And then I just, oh God, <laughs> man. <laughs> But yeah, but basically I just kind of gently saw up and down. There we go. And, but also roll the daikon towards the knife at the same time. Uh, yeah, so like I said, I'm embarrassing myself, but this is how I do it. And, and, and it works okay. The idea is that you want like this really thin see-through piece of daikon. Um... Yeah, it's fun to practice. It's a good way to get, like, practice with your knife. Yeah, like, that's actually not the worst I've ever done. Boom. You could use this, like, in a plating presentation as, as, as a sheet, but generally what it's used for is you cut it into a few sheets, and then you make these, like, little needles of, of, of daikon. And now to explain it to me, but basically... It's so that you have the grain, the grain structure, all facing one direction. I know there's a reason. I don't, I'm not smart enough to know why. But you can also cut this way and then throw it into like ice water and it gets really crispy. So it's just like a nice garnish if you're making some sashimi at home or something. It's, it's similar sort of between a chiffonade and a julienne, but that's... Basically, what you're going for. Yeah. Good. Yeah, it's actually like not awful. I'm being hard on myself, but it's <laughs> not the not the worst. I'm gonna keep practicing if uh, if anybody has a question. All right. Cool. This so, knife is sharper. Okay, I'm sharpen <laughs> this one. Somebody on TikTok says, "Looks great, Chef." Oh, thanks. <laughs> I think that's the first time anybody's ever called me Chef. <laughs> <laughs> um. While you're messing around with that daikon, you got time for a couple of questions? Yep. All right. Sean is asking, would you thin a knife with a migaki or mirror finish? And if yes, can you show one that has been thinned? Migaki or mirror finish? Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, the, the bevel of this knife had like a migaki finish before when it was new. Um, now it's got a patina <laughs> on it, but it has been thinned. Um, I'm trying to think if I have a good example. We don't have, oh, here we go. No, that one's a kasumi. Yeah, it's it's tricky. So I mean, mirror finishes on knives are awesome. They're like I love them. They're so cool, but they're so impractical because they just get scratched up, and and it's it's so hard to to get a mirror finish. Like I know there are people. If if Pierre Tan is watching, I, I think he's good enough to get a mirror finish, but that's also like his hobby. Like he just spends time polishing knives. Um, it's like if you're gonna thin a mirror and polish knife, which eventually you'll you'll have to, I would almost just like get rid of the mirror finish and just get a really consistent finish on the whole thing, so it looks consistent. Because you're gonna have a the bevel's really gonna stand out. Um, Megaki, not so much. Um, what's a good Megaki knife? Like the Haruki. Uh, yeah, the SRS 13 one that is called the Shinogi. Uh, the Haruki Shinogi, those those thin up pretty nice. How, how Sky? How like I'm not good at knife sharpening, uh, by the way. I'm I'm okay, but <laughs> Sky's a lot better than me. How would you get a Migaki finish on? It, like when you thin a knife? all polishing is always such a house of cards when it comes to this kind of thing. So it's like even when you're using it, it's gonna eventually get scratched up. Mm -hmm. So I kind of prefer just to let it patina and call it a day. But if you really wanted to polish something up very nicely. You would just do like just stepping stones of grit and higher and higher. And usually like you'd want kind of a softer stone 
Um, but basically, it's just making sure that all the scratches from the previous stone are gone. Um, mm -hmm. And this isn't really like a service that we offer per se, because it's more of an aesthetic thing than it is like something that you would need for your knife to work yeah. well. So we, we try to restore like a finish to a reasonable amount, but a lot of the insane mirror polishing is more of a more of a hobby type thing than anything. Yeah, and it's a it's a super cool hobby. I have I don't have the patience for that. I, <laughs> I have too much uh, of an attention deficit. But um, yeah, it's it. I don't know, Pierre, if you're watching, help this person out. <laughs> Give them some <laughs> advice if they're trying to do it. Um, we don't have one to show you here. If you shoot us an email, we have some pictures. We have when you come in to get your knife thinned in at Knifeware, which basically the process of grinding this whole bevel helps it cut good in, in plain English. Um, we should have this little like laminated booklet where we show you. Oh, do we? Nacho has one. Do you mind grabbing that? A what? Uh, the booklet, the sharpening booklet. So basically, we have before and after pictures of what your knife will look like before you thin out the bevel and after you thin out the bevel because it does change the aesthetics of the knife. And so we put together a little booklet um, to help you understand that. We've now got uh, these horizontal belt sanders that help even out the finish. And so we took some photos of before and after to, you know, help folks understand that. Sky's just gonna grab that. If you have more questions, pop them in the comments. We'll be live for another 20, 30 minutes. Um, the last two things I'm gonna cut up today are a melon and a pineapple here we go there you go so yeah here we go so that's like <laughs> if you're like a medium level sharpener and knifeware like you're not brand new but you're not like nauto that's what your knife is going to look like after you thin it so pretty good, not perfect, but pretty consistent. That's that's done using a horizontal belt sander to get get that um, th those continuous grinding lines. Because one of the things that that really stands out is like a lot of knives have like horizontal or vertical grinding lines on them, and when you thin it out, it totally changes up that scratch pattern along the bevel. And so we, we sometimes use a horizontal belt to even that out. Um, we don't have a mirror polish one in here because we just don't sharpen that many mirror polish knives and we try to avoid thinning them if we can. Cool. Hope that helps, right? <laughs> What's up, Nato? <gasps> what? You get a carrot. You get a carrot. We you have to we, cut it on camera, though. We didn't get you the big trains. So. Yeah. You want to come? This yeah. is still a secret. Oh, oh, oh. 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 Secret project. Secret project, yeah. okay. I just got all sorts of stuff going on in his workshop. I don't know what's up <laughs> back there. Uh, okay. All right. Do we have questions, or can I cut up a melon and or pineapple? I think we are about. Oh, uh, there was one from Iceman. Uh, how do fine How do fine dice onion like they do in Michelin star restaurants like Marco Pierre White? Mm. Uh, we did our dicing demonstration a little bit earlier in the stream, so if you want to just rewind, yeah. I think it was at about the twenty minute mark or so. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's just like doing those cuts really, really, really consistently, um, and that's about it. But yeah, go watch that, and then if you have more questions, leave us a comment later on, uh, and we'll try to help out more. Melon. <laughs> Start by slapping it. <laughs> you gotta slap the melon, you can't, you can't not. Um, these are pretty easy. They're basically like peeling that orange with a knife, but on a larger scale. Again, cardinal rule of cutting food, anytime you have a roly-poly guy like this, Cut yourself a flat spot. In this case, we want to cut enough of a flat spot we can see that, the inside of the watermelon. Boop. And then, same on the other side. And then we're going to start with our knife just behind that white line, kind of where the, the white meets the red. And we're just going to slide. And you can saw a little bit, but if you have a longer knife, it's nice to slide. And you basically just want to cut off enough So that you get the the white stuff gone without removing too much of the good stuff. And I like to do a one kind of clean gliding motion like this, but if you're not confident doing that, you can absolutely just saw back and forth a little bit. Try not to saw it like tiny little cuts like this. Try to do like a little bit, little bit, little bit like like that. And then 
just remember when you get down to the half wave point, you, you want to really tuck in so that you get everything off the bottom. At the end of the day, if you don't get it perfectly, um, it doesn't matter because you can just go back and trim it. And if you're not like doing this for a catering company, then who cares if it's not perfect? But yeah, it's, uh, it's real simple. Well, I probably should have wiped all the onion off my cutting board before I did this. That's no, fine. And then, yeah, I just cut it down the middle. Ooh, it's got seeds. We can grow watermelons. Get rid of all this junk. That's, this is the real thing. Like, keep your cutting board clean, right? If you got crap piling up all over your cutting board, even if it's a big cutting board, just get it out of there. Boom. Easy peasy. Boop. Well, um, you know, that's like the best watermelon I've had in the winter in Canada. <laughs> Probably the worst watermelon you've ever had. <laughs> I love watermelon. Yeah, me too. I eat it by the half in the summer. <laughs> by the half? I just like, I hold it in my lap with oh my a god. Oh my god, that's intense. Yeah. It's a lot of watermelon. <laughs> you know what I really like? I, I, um, somebody, like a friend whose family's from South America, uh, introduced me to watermelon with tahini. Oh, that's really good. Mm. Yeah, a little spice. A little spice, a little, little tangy citric acid. I just started putting salt on mine. Yeah. Oh, that's a great trick. Thanks, guy. If your watermelon or any melon really tastes like crap, uh, add just a little bit of salt because it helps bring out the sweetness and contrast it and just like upset flavor a little bit. I don't have to put MSG on it. I'm not that big of Might be kind of gross. Might be delicious. Don't know. We'll do that on our next live stream. Yeah. Will it oh. MSG? What can I put on watermelon to make it taste better? Mm. Uh, really quick, Andrew is asking, what size is our cutting board? <laughs> I'm going to look uh, up the This is the large or the extra large large? That's the extra large. Is the extra large? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I have the medium at home, and it's good, but I'm a little sad it's not this one. Yeah, the medium is good for, like, most people, but if you do like to cook big meals and dice six onions at, at, at in one go, you're probably going to prefer prefer this big boy here. This one is 24 by 15 inches. Or get the Hazagawa surfboard, which is just enormous, but like you could fillet a big salmon on here, you clean up a massive brisket, you can do, do so much of that guy. Okay. Cool. Last thing of the day, uh, and then we'll answer any remaining questions and then we'll be done. So thanks everybody that tuned in. But yeah, this guy, this pineapple, um, a lot of people like to cut these and trim off too much, right? And obviously, you showed me, I showed you earlier, like trimming a, an orange or a pine or a, a watermelon with a knife. And I did remove a little bit of the flesh, but I try to be conservative and leave as much behind as I can. So in this case, I, I'm going to save as much of the pineapple as possible. Uh, in in North America, especially in, in Canada, um, <laughs> this is how pineapples come from the store. They're like bright green most of the time. Um, and we didn't have time to ripen this guy, but, um, and so it, it's a little trickier to cut it, um, because there's all these like little spines in it, but if you use the right technique, not so bad. So we're going to start same as the watermelon by taking off the top and the bottom like so, ah, smart. And then we're going to cut, we're going to peel it. Just enough that we get those like sort of scales off, all the green stuff. We're going to leave these spines behind. We don't want to cut these guys off because then you're be going to be cutting off too much of the flesh. <laughs> Did you drop watermelon on the computer? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's only a brand new MacBook. Shh, don't worry about it. Um, and so we just peel like so. And so, yeah, I'm leaving behind a lot of the inedible stuff. But if you cut off these spines, you're just going to cut off too much of the flesh. And so right now we're just focused on getting that tough skin off. <laughs> what? I'm just 
just realized the watermelon I just dropped was like right next to the mic. <laughs> it just oh splat. Uh, there's some ASMR for you. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> We're gonna have to go back and see what that sounds like. Okay, so we got all our pineapple skin. Again, this stuff's not good to eat, so get it off your cutting board so it doesn't end up mixed with your pineapple. And then we're going to take a look at this guy and find the, the, the grain, if you will, the direction of these, of these spines because they actually run in like a, like a diagonal pattern, right? And so ours run this way. And so we're going to kind of follow that and we're just going to cut these little like V shapes just to remove those spines like so. <laughs> Um, and it's, this is a slow process, but you end up with something that looks nice and is less wasteful. See, just cutting out the spines. And this is going to take me a minute, so if we have any questions to get to, or if you have any questions and you're watching still. We have a discussion going on about oh. Kasagawa boards. Oh. Um, Wayne asked, is the FRS board good for vegetables or is the FRB better? Oh, good Lord. That is a very in-depth question. I don't fully know. Um, those are, are those the two we sell? Because we sell two. One's like for home use, quote yeah. unquote. But it's, it, that one's just a bit softer. So it's just a little easier on your knives. Yep. And yeah, somebody already got to it in the comments. Sweet. Uh, Birdie said the FSR is just softer than the FSB. Yeah. Um, so you can cut vegetables on both of them. Yeah. It's more yeah. like, so the one's just slightly better for your knife edges. I mean, they're both great for your knives. Like, they're, they are, oh, I'm almost losing the plot here. What's going on? <laughs> Did I go the wrong way? Oh, I went the wrong way. It's okay. Just oh, no. turn it over. It's okay. Did I? No, I didn't go the wrong way. What? I'm very confused. Nathan went exactly the right way. <clears throat> uh, and Jeff was asking, uh, let's be honest, once you start down this rabbit hole of Japanese knives, it becomes somewhat of an obsession. He's got a <laughs> yeah, 210 Gyudo. Uh, he wants to know if he should get a Petty or a Nakiri next. His heart says oh. Nakiri. Yeah, I mean, you got to follow your heart, right? I mean, let's be honest, Jeff. You're going to end up with both eventually. <laughs> let's, let's be realistic here. Um, I will say I had two Nakiris before I had a Petty. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the thing, though. Sometimes following your heart isn't always, sometimes your heart can lead you astray and you got to follow your head because it took me 10 years to buy a petty knife. And I'm, I'm not joking. I, I worked at, I got my first Japanese knife 12 years ago. I started a knife order 10 years ago and, um, I didn't buy my first petty knife till last year. And, uh, that was a mistake. Um, not the end of the world. Like, you know, I, I still made it. What the hell did I, what? Oh my God. That's so confusing. Um, Okay, well, this is going to be a catastrophe. Anyways, um, <laughs> but but I use my penny knife all the time. I use my penny knife almost every day. It is probably the most used knife in my kitchen. Because sometimes I'm lazy and I don't want to use a big knife and I want to mess around or whatever. It's good for making quick meals too. Like if I'm throwing together a salad to add to my lunch for, for work, um, I just use my penny knife because it's, it's easy. Uh, I bought one that was like, relatively low maintenance it's algami super with stainless on the outside so not the lowest maintenance but not really gonna rust easily um and like i'll i'll leave it dirty next to the sink all day and it's fine when i get back from work so yeah you you might find yourself using a penny knife a lot that said nikiris are awesome and very useful um will they do anything your yuto can't no but they're they're pretty awesome and once people start using a nikiri it often becomes their most used knife so I don't know. Why not both? Yeah, I pull out my Nikiri for just about everything. And we had a petty for a while that my husband would basically just use for uh, doing citrus for his old fashions. Nice. And then I gave it to my mom. Nice. So. <laughs> my most expensive knife, too. Oh, no. <laughs> it was the, the black Damascus SG2 one. Oh, that's such a nice petty. She was like, oh, this is really pretty. Can I get another one of these? And I was like, uh, <laughs> you want this one? <laughs> Yeah. Um, now here's the question. Was it Jeff? Yeah. Jeff, which which Nakiri and which Petty are you looking at? Because that might dictate your decision. If one of them is just more awesome. Okay, so this spiral's supposed to go in one direction. I screwed up. 
but it still looks cool. That's what it looks like. It takes a little time, but you can always, uh, you can take like a, a couple, like a couple ounces of high proof rum, like light it on fire and then pour it over this and have like little flame swirls around it. That's fun. Thing you could do. Um, but then I just cut it down the middle and because you can't really eat the core in pineapples in Canada, I just kind of fillet this guy out with the tip of my knife. Boom. Like so. Easy peasy. Um, and then you slice it up. Oh, that's a firm pineapple. <laughs> that's not bad though. Woo! That's pretty good. Okay, well that is all the stuff I wanted to teach. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Hope you all learned something. If you have questions, we'll hang out for another five, ten minutes, depending on if there's any questions. Um, just pop them in the comments. Yeah, we're just we're still talking about uh, cutting boards. Cutting boards. Uh, somebody asked if how maple compares to the larch. I think. Let me find that really quick. Well, you know what I'm going to talk about? Getting a beer from the beer fridge. <gasps> it's four o'clock, guys. It's four o'clock. Beer time. Woo! <laughs> Nathan woos off camera. Ooh, Jeff says he's between uh, Kurosaki Senko, or if he's feeling really brave and rich, a Danka. Yeah, I mean, Dankas are pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, I would go Danka Petty Kurosaki Nakiri. Yeah, I would do that. Only because I'm not wild about the, the Fujiwara Nakiris. That might be controversial to say. Um, but I like a Nikiri, I like the Masakage Nikiris because they're a little taller, or the Moritake Nikiris because they're a little flatter. The Denka Nikiris just, they're not the flattest and they're not the... I always feel like a Nikiri should have. Is it freezing, Jeff? It's freezing. Oh, sorry, you, you can turn the furnace back on. Is it beer time? Yeah. It's beer o'clock. Um, yeah, so I would go Kurosaki Nikiri, or even like something from Masakage, and then get a, get a Denka Petty maybe. Yeah, we're live. That's okay. There's Tiffany, our warehouse manager. If uh, <laughs> if you've received a knife from us, she may have packed it. Her or one of her team members. Uh, Sven is asking, what were you planning to do with the celery? It's just sitting there all lonely by itself. <laughs> That's I cut a piece of celery, Sven. Did you? I, yeah, I think. Yeah, there's some in the bottom of that container. Yeah. Uh, I will show you my super neat stir fry trick. Do you want to come say hi to the internet? Sure. If you have ordered a knife from us on our website, there's a good chance that Tiffany hey, or uh, a member of Tiffany's team boxed it up because uh, she's our warehouse manager and Tiff is awesome. She makes the rest of us look like professionals. <laughs> we do a good job making us look like buffoons and you do a good job making us look like pros. So. I like making us look like buffoons too. Yeah, that's fine. You got some good videos. Uh, you should show Sky eating this watermelon the way she is eating this watermelon. It is intense. <laughs> <laughs> Just a fork and a quarter of a watermelon. What are you doing with this? It, it's for you. Great, thank yeah. you. Cheers, uh, Internet. Um, celery. I love celery. It's cheap and it's delicious. Um, yeah, it's a great way to, to add some bulk to dishes. Uh, the way I like to cut it for stir fries is I run it straight across my cutting board like so. And then I run my knife at about more than 45 degrees to it, like maybe 70 degrees. And I do this bias cut because celery has a really fun shape. And so I like do, I don't know, sometimes you get it right, it looks like a Nike swoosh. This just looks like a something that isn't that. It looks like a bracket, but it's a cool cut. It's a little different than just like your boring old Julienne. Um, or if you're, uh, you know, if it's, you're, you're, you're making dinner for your nerd friends, you can make yourself some celery Star Trek badges. That's pretty fun. I like that one. <laughs> Wait, that's so cool. Right? Yeah, that's awesome. Oh, I'm 100% so, doing that. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a rad cut. So, yeah, you just you angle your knife about 45 or less degrees, maybe 30 degrees to the cutting board. 
and then I just use the tip and I kind of slide through. It's not something you can do very quickly, but it's pretty neat. Yeah, I like that cut. That's what I do with celery. Um, I, I cook with celery a lot. There's always a head of celery. I really love it raw in salads. Um, if you are, I talk a lot about my vegetable garden, but if you grow celery, the leaves are really good. Uh, I throw them raw into salads and they're delicious. They have a bit of natural like saltiness to them. Um, celery leaves are also good for something else that I can't remember. Uh, oh, stalks, right? Uh, when I make chicken stock, I don't throw in a lot of vegetables, but I do throw in like the heart of the celery because there's a lot of flavor and just like naturally good, tasty things in there. Uh, Evelyn asked earlier if this would be recorded so you can view it later, and yes, we yes. keep all of our lives just, just for you, YouTube. Evelyn. Just for you. Yeah, and we'll we'll try to go through and timestamp it at some point this weekend. Uh, Birdie says my family loves bolognese, so I'm always cutting Julian celery, carrots, and fine diced onions. Yeah. Mine too. Yeah. I I love making meals where you just cut a whole bunch of this stuff real small, and then just like cooking in a big pot, like. You could just throw all that stuff in the food processor and save yourself like an hour, but it's fun. I love cutting like a big mountain of celery all small dice so it just like disappears in the sauce. There's so much like joy that you get out of it. Um, yeah. I'm a big fan of the big pot of bolognese, chili, anything like that. Um, Ryan is asking if we have a Morataka Ko Kiritsuke kicking around anywhere. Mm. I don't know if we do. I think so they turn off the lights in the warehouse, probably. Yeah. Yep. We're the last ones here right now. But we will go on a hunt for a Morataka Kokiritsuke because they are pretty cute. Nope. No, we do not. Uh, we do have a Masashi Koku and Kobunka, which is totally a different knife, but awesome, and you should get this one instead. It's a very thin knife, but Moritaka blades are pretty awesome. My first Japanese knife was a Moritaka Ishime, this 240 Yuto, and it's pretty rad. Oh no, my gimbal died. <laughs> okay, goodbye TikTok. <laughs> Love you. Thanks for tuning in. And now, yes. Sorry guys, my, my gimbal died, so I had to save my phone. Hit a patch says, where is Kent? <laughs> where is Kent? Kent is at home. He, uh, you know, he's he's a busy man. He's got stuff to do. Birdie at oh no, this isn't a question, just a comment. Just talking about all the uh, the veg they're going to be growing. Fifty peppers, twenty five tomatoes in his greenhouse. Oh, growing! I thought you said chopping. I was like, no, no. <laughs> Jesus Christ, that's awesome. And if you got tips for starting stuff from seed? Let me know because I'm yeah. doing that. The first time this year. Jordan's asking you, what would be the most ridiculous thing you'd ever use as a personal steak knife? Oh, I have a hand forged Honyaki 12 inch Bowie knife. I'm pretty sure I've used that as a steak knife when I was camping. <laughs> so that, um, I've also just used like my hunting knives. Like I have a bunch of Hele knives that I, you know, just take like, um, like in the summer we go out to this like lake in Saskatchewan some years and uh, there's lots of fire pits with little fire pit grills and so everybody's cooking up hot dogs but I'm grilling like steaks and pork chops and uh, making all sorts of fun foods so uh, I do usually just have like a, a heli knife or a hunting knife there for like cutting firewood and kindling and stuff and so I usually use that as a steak knife. It doesn't work so good on a paper plate, you need, you need to bring sturdier plates. We have an actual knife question. Whoa. <laughs> that last one was a knife question. Yeah, okay. uh, Robbie Anderson is asking, why do some of the knife makers use a Scandi grind? There's a lot of material behind the edge and they don't work great for root veggies. I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, so those, us knife nerds would call it a Scandi grind. I assume you're referring to something like this Takeda where, uh, where the knife is has a fairly short bevel compared to say this Hato knife. Like these are totally different blades, right? Um, so they would have a different name for that in Japan. And, uh, and it's just a, a specific style. Some makers just like Takeda just 
prefers to make things that way. Um, if you have a really high bevel, sometimes the edge can be too thin, a little too delicate. Um, and so I think it's just their personal preference. If there's a specific uh, example you have, let me know, and I might be able to elaborate on that. Um, yeah, but for them, they're, they're coming at it more of just like, that's the way to make knives. It's either it's the way they were taught to make knives or their personal philosophy. I'm going to let you know a little secret about, about knife makers. Um, not just Japanese ones, but definitely a good number of the knife makers that we work with uh, don't cook at all. Like, they do not use kitchen knives because uh, their wife usually cooks in, in many cases. Um, and it's just... It's just how it is. And so a lot of them actually don't have experience um, uh, using knives in the kitchen, uh, which seems crazy, um, but it's just kind of how it is. You know, they're, they're, they're working hard, making, making, uh, making that money, uh, <laughs> blacksmithing, making knives. That's their career. Um, and so often uh, somebody else in their life will do the cooking um, because they don't have time. Like a lot, especially a lot of these guys, like massage son, he might be working in his workshop till like 11 at night. And so the guy doesn't have time to cook. Um, Somebody there you can almost tell when some knife makers cook like I guarantee you Mario Yamasan at Hado Sakai that dude cooks for sure because this knife cuts food so good. It's it's amazing um, Another good example is Takayuki Shibata-san <clears throat> um, I, I'm, I seem to remember hearing this could be not true, but I, I think Kevin said he kind of encouraged Shibata-san to get more into cooking and into food because it would inform the way that he sharpened his knives. And it does because he, he now is an avid home cook. And so that now factors in a lot more to how he sharpens knives uh, when, when he sharpens because uh, he's a professional sharpener. And, and so it could just be that whatever maker you're referring to uh, doesn't have much experience using a kitchen knife. And, and so they make the knife sharp. Um, and that's kind of the end of it. Bye, Nolan. Have a good day. Enjoy your weekend. Smells yeah. Like yeah, it smells like pineapple. You have some pineapple or something if you want. Uh, it just smells like cucumbers and melons. Yeah. I heard there was watermelon. Yeah. Yep, Sky, I just watched Sky devour half a watermelon. It's a small watermelon, we'll be, be fair. I think it's a little bit. That'll be the next live stream. Just Sky eats entire watermelon. <laughs> watermelon mukbang with sky yeah <laughs> uh anyways uh see ya, ya. pit a pat or pita pat uh heard that knife war is coming to toronto yes when? after now um <laughs> we don't have a solid date we've been so <laughs> we were gonna open in 2020 um and uh i assume you know about the the pandemic that's happened um, and so that delayed our plans. We're opening in 2020, but we want to get it right. We want to be in the right spot. We want to find the right neighborhood, the right piece of real estate. So we're not in a rush. We really want to, but we're not rushing it because we want to get the right spot and not have to, you know, move or whatever. Um, you know, a good example is our Toronto spot. Um, we opened uh, on Hastings <laughs> near Chinatown, uh, and it was a temporary, it was always a temporary spot. Um, and we knew how Hastings was, but uh, the the location expedited our move into a new location <laughs> because uh, it was just a very rough part of town and uh, our staff wanted to work somewhere uh, calmer and safer. And so we would like to uh, just find the right part of Toronto the first time and have a spot that's accessible to people, especially cooks and chefs. Like a lot of cooks and chefs in my experience don't have cars. Um, and so a place that's accessible through public transit or trains or, or what have you. Um, so if you have suggestions, let us know, but uh, especially um, shoot us an email. Uh, we'll pass that along to Kevin um, because he's currently in the process of looking for a space. We're really excited to open there. Um, we will, we will uh, definitely shout it loud from the rooftops when we have a location so you'll know. Thanks for your patience. Yeah, me too. That beer is really like soothing the cough that I had earlier. <laughs> Just some light discussion about knives. Nice. As you would expect. Yeah, it's good. We like people that talk, like to talk about knives. Uh, if you'd like to talk about knives more, uh, join our Discord. There's a link in the description of this video at the very bottom because um, there's a bunch of folks there like to 
like to nerd out about stuff. Um, I make an appearance every two or three months because <laughs> I'm <laughs> terrible at using Discord and I have a kid. <laughs> but um, I'm on Discord a lot more. So Sky's on Discord a lot more. <laughs> yeah, if you have if you have <laughs> questions that actually need an answer, because usually when people ask me a question, four people help them and then I get to them two months later. So, <laughs> but yeah, there's a there's a great community of people. Um, probably the most active member is our man Blank Blank who is a, a professional sharpener in Texas and has recently started making knives in Vegas. He makes some pretty cool stuff. So if you want to see some kind of progress picks and people just talking about food and their families and stuff, it's a fun little group of people. Mm -hmm. I think we're good. Okay, we're good. Yeah. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, you're great. Um, we appreciate you. And uh, Monday, we've got a video coming out about sharpening your knives. So if you watch for the knife skills, maybe you are uh, not as deep down the rabbit hole as some of our regular viewers, and uh, you want to learn about sharpening your own knives at home, um, I've got a video coming out that's just like the most basic way to sharpen your kitchen knives on whetstones. Uh, some great tips for beginners that make it a little easier, um, and uh, yeah, hope you enjoy it. Um, other than that, if you missed uh, our live stream two weeks ago, we have one that I did about knife maintenance and knife care. So if you are, again, new to the world of Japanese knives, you want to learn how to take really good care of your knives, uh, you can check that out. And uh, if you like to, if you're on the other end of the spectrum and you like to really nerd out about knives, especially knife sharpening, in two weeks' time on Friday, we will have Friday, February something, 12th maybe? I think that. Might be three weeks. Two or three weeks from now, we'll advertise it. But we've got a live stream with Naoto, the return of Nauto's Nerdy Power Hour. He is going to be showing us how to sharpen and thin a Takeda knife. Uh, it's we he did this a couple of years ago. It's one of our most watched power hours, um, but it looks like trash because we were really bad at live streaming for like three years. So it's going to look better like this, and uh, and you'll actually be able to see and hear him. So. Uh, definitely tune into that if you like to nerd out about knife sharpening, you want to ask questions, that sort of thing, uh, or you're just kind of looking to looking to learn more. So yeah, thanks everybody for tuning in. Have and awesome if you weekend. have any stickers that you want to send oh, us, I, yeah, I've been meaning all week to mention that. <laughs> we have a sticker wall. We've got some of our posters up here. We got some stickers. We got our buddy Craig's Kitchen Rocks. We got Medium Rare. We got 100% Electronica. So we got some some fun stickers up there. Yeah, if you have stickers you want to send us, send them to our warehouse, uh, number 15, 6025, 12th Street, Southeast, Calgary, Alberta, T2H2K1. Attention, Nathan. <laughs> you just have that one locked and yeah, loaded. Yeah, it's up. locked and loaded. It's ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You're very welcome, you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in today. That Please. was great. Yeah, that was fun. All righty. Bye.